tonight. We'll cover it. Just say. Excuse me, Gary. I'll get to you. Do you want me to stay till the end of the meeting to talk about the dirt? No, no, no. I'll handle that. Do you want me to write you any notes or anything? That'd be great. Uh, not actually. No. Stacy, are you ready? I am. <laughs> okay. Good evening. The July 21st, 2009 meeting of the Sammamish City Council will come to order. Um, Ms. Assistant or Deputy City Clerk, would you call the roll? Mayor John Guerin. Present. Deputy Mayor John Barry. Council Member Lee Felling. Here. Council Member Mark Cross. Present. Council Member Captain Hunter Bay. Present. Council Member Michelle Petiti. Here. Council Member Nancy Lee. Here. I'm doing a fun part. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cross, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is public comment, and this is an opportunity for the public to address the Council. There will be a three-minute limit per person or five minutes if you represent the official position of a recognized community organization. And if you are going to be commenting on the Shoreline Master Plan, I would ask you to hold your comments until we come to that agenda item a little later in the evening. So with that in mind, I don't see anybody on the list that's not going to talk about the Shoreline Master Program. Is there anybody else that would like to comment on another topic? Please state your name and address. Oh, I thought she was going to comment. The city manager's over there. Is he going to make a comment? <laughs> we have one so far sign up, Mr. Mayor. Uh -huh. Well, that's on the Shoreline Master Program, too. Okay. Well, then public comment is closed. Next, uh, are there any <coughs> changes to the agenda that we we would like to make? Um, Mr. Mayor, there is an item related to the um, shoreline, uh, not the shoreline, but the the Lakeshore Park. Sammamish Landing Master Plan? Yes. Item number five? Yes, I'd like to have that taken off the consent agenda. Okay, we can put that, uh, well, why don't we put it right at the beginning of unfinished business, right before eight. Thank you. Because it'll be short. Any other suggested changes? If there's no objection, then the agenda is approved. Any presentations or proclamations, Mr. City Manager? None, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Okay. Us. Next is the consent agenda. And this includes the payroll for the pay period ending July 15th in the amount of $267,433.15 and approval for the claims of the period ending July 21st in the amount of $1,278,962. Um, a contract for City Hall repair, door repair with Western Entrance Technology. Approval of a Gov delivery. An amendment to the Beaver Lake Park Master Plan with Berger. And number six is authorization of a contract award, a chip seal contract. And this is for Tree Farm? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Very good. And then item number seven, proceeds um, regarding distribution of Bellevue ch Jail property sale. And, and that is that uh, out of the sale of some property in Bellevue, we get some hundred thousand or a couple hundred. Sammamish taxpayer paid for the original purchase of this piece of property in Bellevue for the purpose of jail. Mm -hmm. And when the location was abandoned for jail consideration, cities told the county the sales proceeds needs to be distributed back to the cities that were who they originally paid for it. So that's Great. what it is. Good. So we can only use it for jail purposes? Yes. Okay. Hearing no objections to the consent agenda, the consent agenda is approved. So now we come to item number five, which was removed from the consent agenda, the Sammamish Landing Master Plan. Mr. City Manager. Mr. Mayor, this is one of the council's objective to do the master plan in Sammamish Landing Park. Uh, we have already gave <coughs> a council and a park commission in the joint meeting a presentation 
got a council's feedback and uh, we made some changes based upon the feedback that we received from council and we had a public meeting in July 15th here. What is before you is a $7,900 amendment to the contract that we had executed with the consultant, <coughs> the Burger Partnership, and we need that amount of money to do additional surveying at the south end of the property that where it seems to be a confusion on the property lines between us and another private property owner. And we thought that since we're instigating this project that we pay for the cost of the student survey. That's what this is for. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Cross. Yes, uh, money? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you uh, for uh, changing the agenda so I could address this item. I have no objection to the idea of spending the additional survey money on um, determining the exact boundary line. I think that that's important and it's part of how we can know a surety where our property, public property, stops. We've had considerable testimony that um, public access to the lake should be on public property and so where we do have public ownership we should make sure we know where it starts and where it stops and, and make our plans accordingly. Um, my concern is in um, uh, going forward with the um, master plan for this there were a lot of ideas that were presented and I, I thought that uh, staff had did a great job of sort of coming up with a, a wide shopping list and a, a wide range of ideas but I, I don't remember it that the council sort of narrowed that down or looked at each item and said do we really want that in the master plan so all I wanted to do tonight was the comment that a master plan that included all the concepts that were put on the table last time would be a lot more bells and whistles than I'm personally comfortable with approving and that I'm looking for even a simpler plan that would be the master plan maybe we don't even build all of it at once it, it may be in phases but uh, there were there were some items that I thought were above and beyond particularly some of the the stuff related to stream changes and all that that I thought were uh, excessive we have the big trail along the edge of the property uh, my personal intent, uh, you know, hoping to find uh, three other council members who agree with me, is that we focus the pedestrian and bicycle uh, north-south uh, travel on that rather than building whole new elevated facilities. We know how expensive it's been to do that on 20th or 24th and the wetland mitigation and the complications we've had there. So I just wanted to, to be on record as saying that when we do get the master plan back, I do hope that we then can look at it in pieces and uh, I hope that at that point we can look at the individual parts and really um, I hope uh, um, pare it down now maybe the council as a whole will want everything that is included in the final master plan recommendation but um, I just wanted to be on record that there were extra things in there that I don't support and that I hope that um, just to put everybody on notice, I hope that we can go through it more carefully item by item at the time that it's before the council so that it can be um, uh, a master plan that we're all uh, dedicated to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I can just Ms. comment real briefly. Ms. But Parks, director. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, master plan, we just had our final public meeting last week, and we have narrowed it down to a preferred alternative based on comments we received from uh, you folks, the Parks Commission, and in our last public meetings. We will be bringing, I was just looking at the calendar here, September 21st, September 21st, excuse me, a preferred alternative back to the council that I think you'll be pleased with. It's simplified. We took out a lot of the things that um, were extras and probably not permittable just based on some restrictions. So you'll see that in the next uh, two months, and we'll be ready to move forward with SEPA from that process. And that's that point. Matthew? Is that going to have beach facilities? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. On the website so that the public yes. can see it? It is on our Preferred city council long-term agenda calendar, and it's scheduled for the September 21st. To no, I don't mean the schedule. I mean the, the, the master oh, the picture. Yes, if, uh, it, it should be on the website. I will verify that it has been posted. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, do I have a motion authorizing the city manager to sign the contract amendment with the Burger Partnership? So, so moved. Second. Any further comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? By your vote of 7 0, you have that authority. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay.
Next is item number eight, which is an ordinance, the second reading, annexing Rosemont at Timberline subdivision. Uh, we have our uh, community development director and assistant city manager, Cameron Gural here to actually give a report eight and nine and give a very detailed report on 10. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that implies that eight and nine will be a little more abbreviated. Um, <laughs> I think that's appropriate for both of them. For no item number eight, <clears throat> this is really the last council action for the Rosemont annexation. Uh, you've taken the train all the way up to the final station, uh, gotten everybody to sign on the dotted line. Uh, the Boundary Review Board approved the annexation uh, at their recent meeting on uh, July 9th. So this is the second reading of the capstone ordinance. Uh, the big effect for the capstone ordinance really is to establish effective date for the annexation. And we're proposing July 31st of this month. Um, and uh, that meets a whole lot of uh, deadlines out there. I don't know if... Mr. Turbolowski or others from Rosemont are here tonight. I don't see him in the audience, um, but uh, happy to answer any questions from the council um, that you haven't already asked. Any questions from the council? <coughs> Looking at the map, uh, the big track D and track G remain in the county, is that <coughs> correct? That's correct. And the stormwater facilities are on those tracks, or that's where the stormwater goes anyway? Huh? It goes through those tracks. Uh, it may not actually uh, finish <coughs> in track D. It may be an adjacent tract, uh, but that would remain uh, in the county as well. But per the state law of, of storm, stormwater being a common enemy, uh, we just let it flow down onto the county land, correct? Uh, we do, and it's in a and it's in a uh, designed and built system uh, that uh, was done as a part of the development, so it should not create an impact, um, whether we want one <laughs> or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it should be fine, uh, staying in the current configuration. Okay. Uh, I'd like to move that we approve the capstone ordinance annexing Rosemont uh, at Timberline subdivision. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Uh, is there any public comment? I wanted to get if there is. Seeing no public comment, any uh, council comment on it? This is we've covered this and covered this and covered this. I yes. Think. Well, it's it's, so finally we're going to invite these people to join <laughs> us in the city. Yes, so that's my comment. That's I'm right. pleased that we're finally going to invite them to be part of the city. <laughs> <laughs> good, good comment. Okay, all those in favor of, <coughs> of the ordinance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? By your vote of 7 0, ordinance number 2009 262, annexing Rosemont at Timberline subdivision, has passed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Thank you. item number 9, which is <coughs> ordinance second reading amending Title 14A of the Sammamish Municipal Code. Uh, that's right, and uh, the council had their first reading on July uh, 7th uh, for this ordinance. Um, <clears throat> this is really a procedural change, and it's allowance for uh, an applicant for a building permit to uh, choose whether they would pay their impact fee at the time of the building permit issuance, or if they chose, uh, exercise an option to have that fee paid at the time of the closing of the sale of the home. Uh, the ordinance was written and uh, a little bit revised from the first draft that you saw at your first reading. Uh, we both uh, took in some additional comment from uh, the development community, uh, had a chance to discuss a little bit further amongst ourselves and I believe with the city attorney's office. So you have a revised section 13 um, uh, that's uh, in the 14A.15 uh, material and a revised section 12. It's the same uh, statement in each one. Uh, that's the underlying statement that uh, uh, has been substituted. Uh, we think this statement captures the intent uh, of what this effort is, is trying to accomplish. Uh, I can report that the staff have met internally to uh, identify and create uh, any of the administrative mechanisms that it will be necessary uh, to actually implement this ordinance. And so we've uh, proposed an effective date in the ordinance, and I think it's August uh, 13th. Uh, so a little further out, that gives us a little time to make sure we have all of the forms in place. We have to not only provide public information, but <laughs> allow somebody to actually exercise this option. So we're going through that process and working with the city attorney's office to help us create those forms and make sure that we have kind of a, a bulletproof system to work with. Nancy? Uh, I 
reading this, it <coughs> appears that there's a sunset clause. Is that correct? That's so correct. That it would get reviewed with, uh, as a bundle with the others when they. That's out. correct, and we've done several of these ordinances that sub, uh, sunset at that same date. And you're correct; we could look at them as a bundle, um, perhaps a month or two in advance of that date. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Cameron? I, I noticed the last paragraph, paragraph 12 of Exhibit 1, <clears throat> uh, actually explained the concern I had, and that that was, uh, what if you build a house but you don't sell it? Correct. And in there, it's, this applies only for homes that are being constructed for resale. That's correct. If you're building a house on a, ho a lot you already own, you have to pay the fees uh, per the regular schedule. That's correct. At the time of building permit issuance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Nancy? You know, um, t this takes a lien on the property, is that correct? That's the mechanism the city would place at the time of the building permit issuance, and that allows the uh, uh, building to be constructed that may take a number of months, uh, and then sale of that building may take a number of months after so that. Administratively, there's no difficulty in that lien process? Uh, I wouldn't say there's no difficulty. We have a little bit of a challenge to make sure that it's done properly. And we are working, as I mentioned, with the city's attorney's office on the form of the lien. And I think we may have to do a little bit of training, not only in the city here, but also uh, inform escrow companies and, and potentially real estate companies that the city has this mechanism. What we're trying to avoid is the surprised buyer uh, who uh, would be purchasing a home um, and uh, uh, somehow this amount of money would be uh, dispersed out of the escrow proceeds to the city. Um, and we don't want anybody to say, well, wait a minute, that, that's not supposed to go to the city, or someone else is supposed to have paid that, or the builder told me he paid it, or something like that. It needs to be very specific that uh, when the <coughs> permit is issued, the lien is placed on the property, um, uh, we would hope, and this is what we're trying to achieve, is that when a buyer performs a title search and gets title insurance for the property, because the lien has been recorded properly, that that lien will show up at that time. Uh, so that they will know um, that uh, the city has a lien on the property and that uh, out of the proceeds of the sale of the home, uh, the, the city's impact fee will be paid. Uh, I want to take you back to uh, in the last few weeks we were talking about several hundred thousand dollars worth of fees that we haven't collected probably because of the economic climate. Those uh, fees are uh, building permit review fees. What council is looking at before you is the, the impact fee. I, I recognize that, but instead of changing our fee structure, would a solution be to take a lien on those properties for those building permit fees? that remain unpaid um, and if there's no administrative hassle in one context it would seem to me that there it could be administratively done the same way for the uh, per building permit fees and then we would get around the issue of a possible collection collection and uh, also something from the state audit people well, well we'll take a look at it when we bring that issue back before the council it's a good suggestion we'll take a look at it so we'd have to change our code to do that right but we're talking about changing the code anyway to change mm -hmm. our, how we structure the fees well we'll change it right now on this part tonight I agree okay any other questions for Cameron um, how about public comment on this issue is there somebody that would like to comment on it Mr. Miller, please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Uh, Mike Miller, Murray Franklin, 14410 Bell Red Road, Bellevue, 98007. Um, I've been up here before in front of the council discussing uh, the possibility of deferring the payment of the fees until the sale of the house. And this ordinance, uh, proposed ordinance, does effectively do that. And I would urge your support and of the ordinance and I appreciate the efforts that both the staff city attorney and the council's done in moving this forward thank you thank you is there anybody else that would like to address the council uh, council members my name is David Hoffman I'm here representing the master builders Association of King and Snohomish counties uh, you probably have all received a letter that 
um, that I submitted earlier, uh, right before the meeting began. Um, I'll just real quickly, in case you didn't get a chance to uh, read that, uh, go through the, the high points of the letter. Um, we are very much so in favor of this ordinance. Appreciate the effort that staff has taken uh, to work with um, our builders and, and members uh, on this ordinance. Uh, these are very, to put it lightly, interesting economic times. And it, it has, uh, th this ordinance will hopefully provide a little bit of space for uh, our members, uh, like Murray Franklin, to be able to keep people employed and continue building um, at a much slower rate uh, during, during this time. Uh, like I say in the letter, uh, financial crunch has affected us all. It's very difficult for many of our members, um, some who have been building homes in our community for three or four decades, to attain construction lending for projects, even when they have buyers lined up. So removing the need to finance impact fees at the beginning of the process would help to alleviate some of the financial constraints that they're experiencing. So again, appreciate all the work that staff has put into this and uh, urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the audience, the council, and the audience? <laughs> Good evening, Council, and thank you. My name is Duana Koloshkova, and I'm here on behalf of my client, Mr. Miller, um, and master builders, as well as a number of other builders in your community. And I just wanted to express um, our appreciation of your consideration of what is a creative piece of legislation um, and um, appreciate and express appreciation on behalf of all of my clients uh, for your recognition of um, creative way to provide a little bit of interim um, relief to builders out there without a cost to you. Um, I also want to thank the city attorney's office and the staff um, and your city manager for being open to discuss um, some new and creative ways of addressing our difficult economic times that ensure that you actually get impact fees as opposed to ending up in situations where builders may be in default and you don't get impact fees that you're hoping to get. So I think this is actually a, a, an, ex, an important win for the city as well in terms of collecting the revenue that you're anticipating for your projects in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council? No. Then do we hear a motion to approve this ordinance? So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Council discussion? Mark? Um, I want to support this um, ordinance for um, two reasons. One is that um, the impact fees really help us um, in normal busy times when the city is growing quickly to quickly develop capital projects that are needed. The um, uh, stimulus package money uh, passed by the federal government um, which we received three and a half million dollars this year have allowed us to continue doing CIP projects at a good <coughs> clip uh, without um, relying on the impact fee money and second um, really it's the rate at which the city grows that much of this money is needed for as well as the actual direct impacts when the, the, ha the city's adding four and five hundred houses a year instead of fifty uh, the, the rate of change in traffic is such that the direct impacts are felt and felt immediately. And to me, uh, in, over and above uh, the direct relationship that we've established between growth and the need for capital projects, the rate of change is uh, something that has, has reduced. And so I think because uh, we are experiencing a slower growth rate right now that it is a good time for us to uh, be flexible in when we collect these monies. Understanding that when we start to grow quickly again, uh, we will probably need to shift gears back and collect money again at the same pace and at the same time in the permit process as we have done in the past. Good. Um, that comment about the rate of change of growth sounded almost like differential calculus there, Mark. Well, I've been on vacation, so I'm a little better rested, so I'm, I'm ready to take on some of those more advanced subjects. 
So, well, that's good because the Sammamish math contest is still open until August 2nd. <laughs> I, I didn't say I was crazy. <laughs> I'll let my kids worry about that advanced math. Okay, any other comments? Lee. My first one is I, I was amazed how you could make a segue from impact fees to the math contest. I, I'm impressed that you were able to do that. That rate of change comment. Yes. Uh, I wanted to comment a little bit because impact fees are really an important part of our financial structure. And we as a city have a rather unusual financial structure with our extremely heavy dependence on property tax. Uh, as uh, the history of impact fees has been interesting too in that we uh, put forward a plan for a significant increase in impact fees and one of the notions behind it is to try to have growth pay for more of itself rather than the existing property owners uh, subsidize that growth. Uh, and of course in working with the building community, uh, you know, they were very candid that if they had their choice they would prefer a smaller impact fee rather than a larger impact fee. Uh, we worked something out that I think uh, uh, made sense all the way around. Uh, when the economic downturn started uh, very heavily impacting the building community, uh, it's not a, a case of something that's kind of a minor cycle, but I think in the recent history it's been a, a very uh, devastating cycle. And of course the first thought that was expressed is, well, why don't we reduce the impact fees? Uh, I don't believe that would have been prudent for our city because it's with our financial structure it is too critical to the capital projects we need going forward. I think this proposal uh, is reasonable and it's a way that we can uh, help the building community which uh, uh, is important to our community and they are one of our um, uh, uh, constituents. Uh, but to do it in a way that, uh, that makes sense longer term and with a sunset provision allows us to revisit that at a later time. So I, I think this is a rather innovative idea, and uh, I will support this. Good. Other comments? The sunset is the end of 2010, is that right, Cameron? That's Sunset's correct. Excuse me. Yes, mm -hmm. December 30, 2010. Okay. Are we ready for a motion? We have a motion. Oh, we already have a motion. Are we ready? Question. You call them a question. Good. All those in favor of the ordinance number 2009-263, which is uh, amending Title 14A of the Sammamish Municipal Code, please say aye. 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 Opposed? By your vote of 7-0, the ordinance is passed. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Don't go away. So now we're on item number 10, which is the City Council policy decisions on the Shoreline Master Plan. And I think at this point is when we should have uh, uh, public comment unless you have um, an introductory remarks, Cameron. Um, well, we've been, uh, I have a PowerPoint to just to orient everybody. It's up to the council whether you want to go through that first or take public comment first. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Stacy's going to be uh, lowering the blinds a little bit so that it's a little easier to see in the council chamber. For tonight, um, our, I'll do a brief recap of the process to date. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to continue hearing council direction um, on uh, the Urban Conservancy designation. Uh, council asked for some supplementary information, which we've provided in your packet. We'll talk a, a minute about the ordinary high watermark issue and the staff recommendation there. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about next steps for the public hearing and the council adoption. I won't go through all of these, but you can see in gray are all the steps the council has undertaken itself um, since the beginning of the year. You're here uh, for your final policy direction session here tonight, July 21st. Uh, in your packet, uh, we had four items, uh, staff notes reflecting uh, your direction from July 7th. Uh, you also see the direction from the July 2nd, or I'm sorry, June 2nd and June 16th meetings in that. Uh, background info the council requested on the urban conservancy designation and some of the implications of a couple of the policy choices we have. Um, we've given you again policy direction page uh, uh, 11 um, in case you want to reconsider or confirm your earlier policy direction and then the memo on the ordinary high watermark. Uh, I think under the city manager tab in your council packet. Uh, you have uh, all of the actual source documents for that ordinary high watermark issue. 
Just to orient ourselves again for the topic tonight, which is mostly related to urban conservancy, I want to remind you that um, we are uh, renaming our designations within the city of Sammamish. Right now we have, most of the city has a designation on the shoreline called rural. That is going to the shoreline residential designation. We, uh, we also have existing a conservancy designation and that is being proposed to rename to urban conservancy. So just keep our nomenclature uh, clear here. That's how things uh, uh, actually work. So for urban conservancy, um, this is really the, the sort of uh, thumbnail sketch of, of what it is and, and why it is. Generally under urban conservancy and even the current conservancy designation, you have a generally less intensive development pattern. Houses are typically set further back, uh, the lar lots are larger, um, and, and so forth. Um, and that has been guided uh, by the King County Shoreline Master Program, which of course, as you know, is currently still our Shoreline Master Program. Um, con urban Conservancy is uh, seen as suitable for single-family residences and a variety of other uses you can see there. Um, and the recommendation coming out of the consultant work and the Planning Commission was to generally continue that development pattern in our new SMP document. For shoreline residential, generally these are the uh, areas that are more fully built out with single family uh, development. Um, the, uh, they are suitable for continued uh, residential development at adopted densities. Uh, by and large, that is almost exclusively R4 with a few areas of R1. Um, and then again, recommendation is generally to continue that development pattern in the new SMP. So how do we go about determining the proposed designations here? Well, first, our first step was re to review the existing designation. So anywhere there was rural, uh, that was a candidate area for shoreline residential. Anywhere that was conservancy, it was a candidate for urban conservancy. We also looked as a part of the uh, initial characterization report at the overall ecological conditions. You can see some of the things that um, are part of that assessment. Uh, we identified segments or reaches along the shoreline with similar conditions. Uh, as this is a designation we would not want to apply on a house by house or an individual lot by lot basis. You want to identify larger areas that are either called stretches or reaches that have similar conditions. And then we match the conditions to the designation criteria. Then that was discussed and refined a bit during the planning commission process. Um, here's uh, how some of those designation changes uh, uh, came about. Uh, for Lake Sammamish, remember the old conservancy designation would have gone to urban conservancy, but in 43 cases it went to shoreline residential. Uh, 40 of those 43 were as recommended by the consultant and the staff. Three were recommended by request uh, by those property owners and then recommended by the Planning Commission. So 43 more shoreline residential lots than uh, urban conservancy. Uh, any of them going the other way? No, zero. On Pine Lake, uh, conservancy to shoreline residential, zero. And uh, four lots going uh, the other way from rural to urban conservancy. One of them is public, and the urban conservancy designation is the designation we're also using for the public areas uh, on our various uh, lakes there. A couple of beach club uh, lots where, again, uh, that area was larger and seemed to match the criteria, and one single family residence. I understand that was by request. Beaver Lake, um, oh, that, I'm sorry, that one was not by request. It was for on Beaver Lake where we had the request. For Beaver Lake, we had conservancy to shoreline residential, kind of like for Lake Sammamish, 17 made that switch. And then rural to urban conservancy, uh, just three, two public, and then one SFR uh, by homeowner request. Uh, you have seen uh, about, I think it's seven uh, individual changes that have been uh, provided or proposed to the City Council by individual landowners. Uh, we do not have all the material ready to give you a full assessment and recommendation on those changes uh, for tonight, so we're recommending that we take care of that as you go through your final uh, public hearing process and then your deliberations. We'll be supplying you with some additional information of that as a part of the uh, Council Draft SMP review process. So what's the effect of uh, of the Urban Conservancy designation. There has been some concern about that. Two of the uh, proposed uh, limitations for Urban Conservancy have to do with dock spacing and subdivision. The third was the uh, impervious surface. 
Um, I, uh, we did not uh, include further information on that. There wasn't a sense from the council that you wanted to look at that further and that we're going to stay in a kind of a citywide posture for impervious surface. So for these two, the dock spacing, if you were to uh, reintroduce that policy choice, uh, you'd have 13 fewer docks citywide, 11 uh, fewer on Lake Sammamish, perhaps one uh, fewer on each of the two smaller lakes. I would caveat that to say that that is our best guesstimate, given the information that we have. There is really no way of uh, giving you a, an absolutely accurate number. So this is probably plus or minus two or three, uh, is my guess, uh, for each of these numbers. Is that assuming that what lots could be created were created and each one had a dock? I believe so. Mm -hmm. And then for subdivision, might affect three parcels, Lake Sammamish, uh, one parcel, two on Beaver Lake, and we don't see anything being affected on, on yes. Pine Lake. Um, the first slide showed, uh, Conservancy showed uh, a bunch of uh, things, what, the criteria, I think it was? Uh, sure. This one here? Uh, yes. Okay, the second bullet point, mm -hmm. um, public access. Um, we've taken out the public access ex to replace for new it. for new subdivisions. You did. This is for existing public parks. That's why I put it there. Oh, public access and recreation through Pine Lake Park or Beaver on Lake public Park. Land. Could we identify that's on public lands then? That because, is on public um, land. Otherwise, the specter of that coming onto private lots is something that we decided we. I think the council want. was very clear about that and is not being proposed for reconsideration. Thank you. Yes. On the subdivision limitation, the numbers of parcels are quite a bit lower than they are on the proposed designation changes at the top. Um, does that mean that some of these parcels up at the top here that are going to Urban Conservancy would not be large enough That's to correct. be subdivided? Is That's that correct. What yeah, I and that? again, it's our best guess given the information that we have to work with. Certainly, we have not gone through the subdivision process, and many of these haven't even come to us for any kind of subdivision process. It is our estimation based on lot sizes and what those uh, limitations might be, and our understanding of the availability of sewer service versus septic, <coughs> and so this was our, our estimate there. So three parcels out of the, I guess you're right, the 17 that was uh, uh, shown there uh, would be affected by that. So uh, that's all I have on that uh, item. Um, let me go on to ordinary high water mark, and then we'll talk about a few of the extra steps on the process. Then you can take public comment, and then I'll rejoin you. Uh, ordinary high water mark, uh, you saw there's a two-page memo from me in there. Uh, we have gone through a, a, a review process um, to evaluate uh, the available resource documentation. There have been two meetings. Uh, homeowners, uh, the city staff, agency staff, uh, and council members have participated. Uh, you've got those source documents in your binder there. Um, the participants in those meetings and review of those materials has not produced a consensus recommendation for a uh, default number. Um, and as you saw in my memo, uh, there is some, I think, good rationale for the city uh, using a default number, as we do now, uh, to save applicants money and uh, to ensure some consistency of, of approach uh, across different uh, parcels. Uh, so we're coming up with the idea that uh, we do our own study. Uh, we reported this to you last time uh, you met on July 7th, and our recommendation uh, remains the same. Uh, we would uh, not adopt a default number in the SMP itself, rather we would do so administratively. That's been a very um, uh, uh, specific uh, recommendation from the Department of Ecology that we not adopt a number in the SMP document. And, um, and I think that's fine. Uh, plus, I think actually accomplishing the study and doing it right uh, will take us some time past the SMP adoption. Uh, target date. So that's probably going to take us some additional time to, to consider. Uh, so adopting that administratively, I think, is, is fine. Today, we use, uh, as, you, as I said in my uh, memo, we use the City of Bellevue number um, from their study, and we've adopted that administratively and have been using that since about 2006.
Last couple of slides here relate to um, what we've got to get, what we've got to accomplish to get to the finish line. Uh, this is my little list I came up with um, when staff and I were having um, a cozy three-hour meeting to look through all of the materials, uh, you know, table covered with paper, uh, trying to make sure we knew where everything was and and how we were going to uh, craft a new document. Uh, number one goal here is reflect the city council policy direction in the council draft SMP. We also need to address the input from homeowners and stakeholders. Um, some of that is uh, uh, consistent, some of that is in conflict. We'll do our best to address that as fairly as we can. We do have to achieve the no net loss objective that's coming out of the state uh, for us to have an approvable SMP. Uh, you asked us to make this more readable, and so we're going to attempt to do that as well. One thing that is a, an additional resource document for us is that City of Redmond's SMP excuse me, has been recently approved by DOE, so that gives us uh, a good tangible uh, example right next door. And of course they have uh, some uh, jurisdictional area on Lake Sammamish, so we'll be taking note of that from everything from what the standard setbacks that they've adopted is to the, to the wording that they've used. Um, we do have to address public uses and, and standards in this document. Uh, we do have to in incorporate and or reference the critical areas ordinance and we have to do so properly even though we have uh, uh, some conflicting uh, uh, case law and legal direction out there. Uh, we will be relying on the direction from the Department of Ecology and how to do that as best we can. And then the document has to be internally and externally consistent with the balance of our code. And of course, many other things to all make that, that possible. So we've got our work cut out for us uh, to accomplish that in the next several days. So getting to the finish line, our goal is to publish that council draft SMP in early August. I have a bit of a personal incentive in that uh, my very lovely partner will uh, uh, not be so happy with me if we don't publish it by early August and we can't go to Vancouver as we're planning. So I have a, a direct incentive to do that. Um, we are intending to hold a public informational meeting as we committed to uh, and the working date for that is Monday, August 17th. Uh, and I ask uh, some of the folks from the homeowners groups that are, have been attending all these meetings, um, we'll get that out by email, but if you want to start sharing that with uh, your folks now so that can get on calendars, I think that would be very helpful. Um, and I would note that uh, homeowners group have been uniquely helpful in getting information spread quickly and effectively, so um, please get that date out there. Uh, working time is probably going to be about 5, 5.30 to 7.30, something along those lines. So we'll try to capture the late afternoon through early evening time frame. It'll probably be similar to our dialogue table settings where we'll have tables set up in here and that allows for people to ask questions and interact versus a we talk, they listen uh, type of format. The goal there is to try to make sure everybody understands what's in the document. Uh, it is not an attempt uh, for us to, uh, or a substitute for public testimony to the City Council. So that process is still there. Uh, we're certainly interested in any comment that might uh, come our way. Um, and if there's an opportunity for us to clarify something that <laughs> night or, or when we present to the Council, we will certainly do that. Uh, any council members that are interested in attending, certainly uh, you're uh, welcome to come in, observe, and, and listen, and uh, certainly ask us questions any time after we get the document published. Um, your schedule calls for a deliberation or public hearing on September 1st. Um, we said kind of extended time on the earlier PowerPoint, anticipating that that might be a long night of hearing a lot of public testimony. Um, we shall see. Uh, how long that takes. Uh, but then you've got to hit the gas pedal and, and, and avoid hitting the brake to get to the finish line. Mm -hmm. uh, de uh, deliberations and amendments on September 8th and 15th. I'm going to observe again that you're going to close public comment on the 1st. And I'm going to caution you against taking more public comment after that pu public testimony is closed. Uh, the 8th, 15th, and 22nd are the time for the council to make deliberations and decide amongst yourselves. Um, if you decide to take more public comment, uh, I am concerned about process because we will not be advertising those for additional dates. Um, so council adoption on September 22nd is your target date. Uh, after that, uh, we all take a bit of a breather, breather and then we have to publish what you adopted. 
uh, certainly you will give us, um, as you have before, uh, the direction to incorporate any changes the Council makes to the Council Review Draft in the final published document. Uh, and we intend to get that published in October, then transmitted to the Department of Ecology. That's the part of the process we don't control the direct timing for. Um, so uh, we will see how fast they undertake that. I think City of Redmond's plan did uh, take a number of months uh, to get through the Department of Ecology process. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, but I think we can all count on 2010 at some point uh, before they would finish. We don't know what they will say, um, but it has <coughs> happened in some other jurisdictions uh, that they would ask us to make revisions um, if they found a portion of the document either unclear or not consistent with the guidelines. So we'll do our best to try to avoid that um, and explain uh, uh, the, the pros and cons before the council adopts. Um, but that's a part of the process we'll have to uh, we'll have to manage as we as we get through it. I think it should be pointed out that September 22nd uh, is the fourth Tuesday of the month. So basically it's a special meeting in September. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. No. But Don, I noticed that December has been changed as well. well and the third I, Monday. I, I don't, I probably shouldn't bring it up at this point in time, but it seems like the calendar dates are not consistent with the way we've been meeting. Well, we'll bring it up under the city manager's no. report. Right, we, we showed this this calendar, um, I think, about a month or six weeks ago, and I did, um, at the time, note that this would be a special meeting. Uh, we are trying to get this done um, by the state deadline, as well as not uh, barge too fur much further into the rest of the council's priorities for the rest of the year. So that's the, the hope that people can be free on that day. Uh, I gave it to you up there. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions or you can proceed with public comment. Okay. Uh, questions at this point before public comment? I will have some questions about the summary of the earlier materials. Would that oh. be better later on? Yeah, or? let's get public comment now. Uh, I've got uh, about four people on the list here. Peter Scontrino. Good evening. My name is Peter Scontrino. I live at 21832 Southeast 28th Street on Pine Lake with my wife, Connie. We've lived there since 1978. On November 4, 2008, the City of Redmond passed Ordinance Number 2410, the City of Redmond Shoreline Master Program. The SMP was submitted to the Department of Ecology for review and approval. On July 7, 2009, Redmond received a letter from DOE approving their plan with a number of minor changes. I have attached one copy of that letter. I spoke with Kathy Beam, a principal environmental planner for the city of Redmond. She told me that their SMP has no buffers on Lake Sammamish and was approved by DOE without any requirement for a buffer on Lake Sammamish. Their SMP does have a 35-foot setback on Lake Sammamish, which can be reduced to a 20-foot setback with lakefront plantings. I urge you to eliminate all shoreline enhancement zones and buffers from the City of Sammamish SMP. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scontrino. I did read the, the Redmond one with regard to the plantings, and I think what it says is uh, uh, if you have a 35-foot setback and you do a redevelopment, or new construction, you have to put native vegetation in 50% of the 20 yes. feet setback. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Collins? Good evening, my name's Mike Collins. I live at 2841 East Lake Sammamish Parkway, Northeast. Um, I'm here on the SMP. I, 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 I think this is a tremendous you speak process. Speak a little louder, Mike. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to let you know I think you're doing terrific work. I'm very glad to be able to have spoken to each of you. Uh, the process is extremely complicated, and I'm looking forward to its conclusion. If there's any any way that we can possibly help, um, if you need proofreaders or anything else through your through your publish through the uh, City Council draft SMP publishing process, we'd be more than happy to help. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, maybe Don Sanders should get in contact with Mike Collins regarding volunteers, huh? Mike, you're going to regret that statement that you just made there. <laughs> <laughs> Dwight Martin. I'm Dwight Martin, 5101 East Lake Sammamish Parkway Northeast. Um, so this is about ordinary high water. What a surprise. Um, at the top paragraph there, I was just thinking about, well, what does this really affect? Why do we talk about it so much? It's a very foundational concept, and uh, so I listed some of the uses for the ordinary high water there for your enjoyment. Um, I agree with Cameron. I have three recommendations I'd like to make. Uh, uh, one that he didn't mention, which is let's please include the definition which is found in our state code in our SMP. It's very important that we have that in there because it's a very clear definition and without that in there people don't really know what these initials mean. Uh, second, uh, please do not use the elevation 2818 as a fixed elevation for the ordinary high water mark in the city of Sammamish. This elevation has been misquoted from a Bellevue study as a proven ordinary high water mark on Lake Sammamish. However, all of the 27 points identified in this study were found below 2818, and the report's conclusion is that with a 95% degree of certainty, all of the lots in the city of Bellevue would have ordinary high water marks below this elevation. Third recommendation is please consider a future administrative action which picks a fixed elevation of the ordinary high water mark at or near 27. This is consistent with other agencies, King County, the Army Corps, and it's also confirmed by observations I've made at Sammamish Landing with a licensed surveyor on July 9th of 2009. Uh, you could take a look at the next page. That's a report the surveyor uh, wrote for me, for you. Uh, first paragraph is his credentials, then it talks about the ordinary high water mark, it reviews the methods and the site visit that we made, confirms uh, my estimation of the lake level, which we also got a USGS uh, to confirm. So uh, I especially like this sentence. It says, this is an excellent verification of the methodology and accuracy of Mr. Martin's work. I could read that again, but I won't. <laughs> so the results of our work, um, we had five, five elevations that were at or about the elevation of 27. And then um, the last paragraph is very interesting. It talks about the ordinary high water mark being a monument which can be moved. It's a physical feature. If it's destroyed somewhere, you can go somewhere else and look for it and find it and transfer it. It works especially well on a level body of water. There's a picture. I, I only had enough for you to share. I think it's very interesting. Uh, when you read the definition, it talks about examining the bed. That's the first thing you look at. Well, here we see a gravel bed on Lake Sammamish. And then examining the bank. And here we see a soil bank. And then look for the line of vegetation. Well, it's really evident in these pictures that there's a very green line there at the top of this bank. And on the lower left-hand side, the surveyor pointed out to me the mosses that grow there. And, uh, you know, that's a very clear indication of an upland type of a plant that has not been washed away by the action of the soils. So that's how the surveyor finds these points. One last thing is the graph on the back, which is a hydrology graph uh, for Lake Sammamish. It ends uh, about today on the right-hand side, and it goes back into September. So it's not a full year. But I, I looked at four or five years back, and I, I thought it was quite interesting. It was very consistent that we have a fall flood, we have a midwinter flood, which is usually the largest, and then we have a spring flood. And uh, in this case, if you look at line 27, which I highlighted and I wrote flood above, um, you can see that we're bouncing around 27 quite a bit, and that in the growing season we're well below it. So this is why vegetation lives at that elevation, because in the winter when it's dormant, it's flooded. It's actually quite well protected from the action of the waves because the waves are above the vegetation. Then it drops down and in the growing season it's happy and growing and, and uh, that's, that is why there is an ordinary high water mark at 27 on Lake Sammamish. So uh, I hope that we will have an administrative uh, action that acknowledges this and acknowledges the Corps' uh, good work finding that elevation. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dwight. Uh, Gary Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Gary Smith, and I live at 5011 East Lake Sammamish Parkway Northeast. And I'm here to talk about the issue of the, the zoning of residential, excuse me, shoreline residential and urban conservancy. And I guess at a recent council meeting, there was some discussion of relooking at my property and the property of my neighbor, which had been proposed to the council as being shoreline residential and changing it back to uh, ur urban residential. And I guess I'm here to say why. I don't understand. The Planning Commission made this recommendation. I understood that this council had looked at that recommendation, said it was fine. Um, so I'm in a quandary as to why at this late hour we would reconsider that. Uh, both properties are uh, pretty highly developed residential properties. Um, <clears throat> to us, it's a down zone. Um, it imposes greater restrictions on our properties than like properties elsewhere on the lake. And so I'm here to urge you to support um, residential, excuse me, shoreline residential designation of our properties rather than the urban conservancy. Uh, I guess I'm confused. What, what are they now under the current law? I couldn't tell you. I really Because you're saying they're, we're down zoning it. So the Planning Commission brought to you and suggested shoreline residential. Oh. And I'm understanding that there is some discussion as to changing this to urban residential. And urban I don't know why. Urban conservancy, yes. And I don't know why. Um, Cameron, uh, I, I didn't think we were changing any from shoreline residential to urban conservancy, are we? Uh, no, that's not on the table for you here tonight. Uh, the Planning Commission and um, Mr. Smith's lot was originally identified as urban conservancy in the consultant draft that went to the Planning Commission. My understanding is Mr. Smith and Mr. Martin both attended the Planning Commission, asked for their designations to be changed to shoreline residential, and the Commission agreed with those. And those have been passed along to you. Uh -huh. uh, there is no proposal to change those designations for either of those two lots. Um, so I'm sorry, Mr. Smith uh, was under the wrong impression, but that's not before the council. Uh, just so that the council is clear, uh, there are still lots that were proposed for urban conservancy in the Planning Commission recommendation elsewhere on Lake Sammamish, Beaver Lake, Pine Lake. And the question is, if that designation is retained, what are the rules for that designation? And that, that's really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't affect Mr. Smith's property. Okay. So you can sleep comfortably tonight. Mm -hmm. We should uh, is there any other public comment? <laughs> okay, Rory, uh, Rory first, and and then Reed. And oh, okay. <laughs> Four minutes. <laughs> Remember last week it was only a minute, so uh, <laughs> it might be thirty seconds longer. Uh, Rory Crispin, uh, P.O. Box four zero four four three, Bellevue nine eight zero one five. My cabin's on three zero two three East Lakes Mamish Parkway Southeast. Can you talk up, please. Oh. Yeah, for some reason tonight, it's very hard to hear everybody. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good. The ruling in FutureWise v. Anacortes confirmed the legislature's intent that shorelines of the state are regulated by the SMA, not the GMA. Department of Ecology's plea for reconsideration was denied, and the ruling stands. The Growth Management Act does not regulate inside shorelines or until a new local SMP is approved. The shoreline is regulated only by the SMA. The state Supreme Court ruling emphasized the goal of the SMA in balancing public use, private ownership, and protection of the state's shoreline as less burdensome than the goals of the GMA and described the GMA's best available science as a benign term with often a heavy price tag. There have been recent submittals of alleged best available science documents pertaining to creeks and streams with the intent to project and overlay the creeks and streams ecosystems and environment into that large body lake ecosystems. Studies not associated with lakes are not in keeping with the goal of the SMA. Let's apply known lake science and known lake studies to the lakes. 
For instance, public sewer systems have actual science and historical data showing benefits for lakes. Whether a private uh, septic system is functioning well or not, phosphates are still entering the soil in close proximity to a lake. If it is the opinion of the council that the current method of private human affluent disposal systems is sufficient <laughs> to protect Pine and Beaver Lakes to meet no net loss of eco ecological function, surely a narrow shoreline planting area with minimal science, not exceeding five foot, ought to be sufficient for those lakes too. Finally, I don't understand the council's new position on takeaways. In particular, the change to reduced dock size from 600 square foot to 480 square foot. Today, the city permits and King County SMP allows new docks up to 600 square feet. On Lake Sammamish today, the Army Corps allows 600 square foot docks. The permit requires a second tier review of the RGP3 guidelines. All docks must meet the Army Corps and Fish and Wildlife requirements, incorporating new daylighting deck decking materials, piling, um, spacing, foreshore planting offsets, and on and on and on. Uh, a, any new Army Corps dock permit on Lake Sammamish meets the state mandate of no net loss of ecological function. So why the takeaways? The example used by council two weeks ago, six feet by 80 feet equals 480 square feet, does not get you an RGP3 permit. It would be denied. If you fully understood the permit requirements, you would understand why. Even Bellevue's illegal CAO code, also mentioned two weeks ago, simply mimics the Army Corps and allows larger docks in a second tier review called off-ramps. If the Army Corps allows it, why is the council taking away the 600 square foot max dock allowance? Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Reed Brockway, 167 East Lake Sammamish Shore Lane, Northeast. Uh, believe it or not, I'm not here to talk to you about buffers tonight. In fact, I'm not here to talk to you about what I was going to talk to you about tonight, which was uh, not feeling a compulsion to uh, provide the DOE with something that will sell. Uh, and reading what uh, the staff has recommended regarding ordinary higher watermark, I think you have a way uh, of avoiding that issue in that context. And uh, I, I hope that um, you do what's right in the future, irrespective of the DOE, and let the chips fall where they may. Now, what I wanted to talk about, I just decided, was um, the May 19th or SHO or whatever you want to call it, uh, city revised version of the SMP. A tremendous amount of effort went into that to make it internally consistent, understandable, clear, um, and um, a tight document that would constitute basically law, which is its purpose. It's not essential that uh, it be used stem to stern, but I would strongly recommend that you have start staff use its paragraphs um, as a starting point and modify them as it sees fit, rather than going back to the Planning Commission version and trying to bring that around to some semblance of a clear and concise document. You have a, a resource there that I think is very valuable that you can take advantage of that represents hundreds of hours of our effort in trying to clean it up. And uh, we're not trying to, trying to take credit for anything, and we're not trying to manipulate your policy decision, but we think you have a big leg up if you use that or instruct staff to do so. Thanks very much. Thank you, Reed. Next. Hi, Linda Eastlick. Uh, my house is at 2032 222nd Avenue Southeast <coughs> of Sammamish. And I have a couple of points that I would like to cover. One is the policy direction on shoreline stabilization. Uh, from July 7th, it says, when evaluating the need for new structural shoreline stabilization, alternatives to structural stabilization will be considered in the following order of preference. One, no action. Allow the shoreline to retreat naturally. I won't hit the other two because that's the one that I care about. I'm um, curious about the, the purpose of allowing the shoreline to retreat naturally and um, what the point is of putting the burden on those few property owners who do not currently have bulkheads or a bulkhead or alternative. And I would also suggest that it's not necessarily a natural process 
when there is surface water that's managed through some properties and tends to backwash and wash away shore in heavy rain periods um, or periods of heavy water flow. Also, I would just urge that a green shorelines approach be used in the case where there's not currently some form of shoreline stabilization. The other point I'd like to talk about is for Lake Sammamish, and this was from June 16th, in regards to the interior side yard setbacks. And this has nothing to do with me because I don't live on Lake Sammamish. But um, it says interior side yard setbacks to total 15% of lot width with a minimum five foot width for sides of a structure. And again, um, well, maybe not again, but it sounds to me like this is creating a view corridor for people. And I heard discussion from council before about how um, mandating a view corridor is not appropriate. And it seems to me that those property owners are already limited by the imp impervious service lim surface limitations and by the setback, whatever terminology you want to use, the setback from the shoreline. Um, and I, too, would reiterate what Reed has said about the May 19th document. I've heard comments about um, not reading it or uh, things along those lines. And I would just encourage uh, granting the respect that we're asked to give to the council members to also grant that to the homeowners and read the document and, and see if, if um, if some aspects of it work and recognize that there was a lot of work put into it. It was not a document that was put together with the intent of um, being a 100% win for the property owners because there was a lot of give. There, there maybe wasn't as much give in some areas as some would like, but I think um, it's a good document and there was a lot of work and professionalism and research involved in that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments? My name is Mary Jo Kaler. My husband, CJ, and I live at 21911 Southeast 20th Street. Um, and I come tonight to ask you to carefully read the statement from the city of Redmond that has been accepted by the Department of Ecology, um, particularly as it applies to the issue of buffers uh, and setbacks. I would refer you to page 16 of 40 of the Redmond document, and I would like to read um, just a brief section of that. They have used language that I think is what we, the homeowners, have been asking for in this document, that we all work to achieve a sense of balance between the competing needs and interests that are affected by this document. And that seems to be what Redmond has done and which has been accepted by the Department of Ecology. This document says, and in their references to Lake Sammamish, but I think in our case it equally applies to Beaver and Pine Lakes. Because Lake Sammamish's shoreline is largely developed, there are no buffer requirements along the lake. There is, however, a lakefront building setback. Redmond's shoreline buffer policies reflect these variations between shoreline areas. Given the local and regional significance of Redmond's shorelines for fish and wildlife habitat, shoreline buffer policies are based on the recommendations of fish and wildlife habitat managers and scientists throughout western Washington. At the same time, Redmond's buffer policies balance the evolving knowledge of habitat managers with local development conditions. Um, for us as property owners, this issue of buffers versus setbacks and the restrictions to the use of our property is a very contentious issue because depending on the size of our properties, it can range from 1 to 2 percent of our total property that's affected to as much as 13 percent um, 
and I'm not sure it may, as we've done some more research, it may go even beyond the 13 percent, that the city's regulations would impact how each of us may use the property that we've paid for, that we pay taxes on, and that we work very hard to make uh, into a good and contributing part of our community here in Sammamish. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, next, please. Good evening. My name is Michael Pizzo, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of my parents who own property at 3123 okay. East Lake Sammamish Parkway Northeast in Sammamish. Tonight I wanted to address the topic of urban conservancy, as by the current maps my parents' property is proposed to be zoned as such. So while Gary may sleep well at night, uh, those of us who have not individually argued our case <coughs> cannot. The designation of urban conservancy as, as, as defined in the WAC is intended to protect and restore sensitive lands within urban or developed settings that are not, and I quote, generally suitable for water dependent uses. Water dependent uses are defined as uses that cannot exist in a location that is not adjacent to the water. And this would include the unique characteristics of a waterfront home, such as a dock. The current Sammamish draft SMP contains similar wording to the WAC in its description of urban conservancy. However, the exclusion of water dependent uses is conspicuously absent from our draft SMP. In other words, while the WAC is explicitly directing areas suitable for water dependent use not to be designated as conservancy, our draft SMP does exactly the opposite. The reason for excluding water dependent uses in the WAC is because it allows greater opportunities for regulation now and in the future of conservancy environments. Zoning areas of conservancy when they are clearly residential by virtue of the fact that they have been legally developed as such inherently limits our ability to apply general regulations to conservancy environments in the future where such restrictions are inconsistent with the current permitted uses of those properties. By contrast, WAC defines shoreline residential environments as areas inside urban growth areas that are predominantly single family or multifamily residential development or are planned and platted for residential development. Clearly, properties already developed as residential meet this criteria and should remain zoned as shoreline residential to protect both the owner's investment in the developed properties as well as the meaning of the conservancy designation now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council on this? Hearing none, uh, I think what happened to our uh, erstwhile Cameron? Hiding in the back there. Uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> Ever erstwhile. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I think we're ready to, uh, to get down to business here. Well, if you'd look at your packet here, um, Really the only piece of the packet here tonight that's uh, here for your um, policy direction is that uh, page number 11, uh, reprinted page number 11 of the policy direction summary pages. It's exhibit three mm -hmm. in your packet. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this. Yep. I think your neighbor could help you make sure you got to the right page. Cameron, I think before we go to that, uh, you, you did provide us a uh, council direction that you interpreted from our earlier meetings. And there were some statements with regard to that from public comment and also uh, some council members had some questions <coughs> on that. So maybe we could go through those pages first. Sure. Uh, let's start with the exhibit one, council policy direction from the July 7th, <coughs> 2009. Nancy? Um. I had a specific comment there on the uh, docks. Um, I'm not sure what the rationale was for reducing them from the current 600 for Pine and Beaver uh, down to 480. Um, I would say this. My understanding is if we reduce it down, then we are making all existing docks that are over 480 nonconforming. Um, I have a big question. What happens uh, in terms of grandfathering? if we want to replace the docks, uh, maybe the tops of the docks. We have a, a dock that's built to the 600. Um, the pilings are in place, so we're redoing the top of the dock, maybe the structural support of the top of the dock. Are we going to be able to do that? Um, the expense involved of redoing pilings 
is huge. Um, so I really like the idea of keeping for Pine and Beaver the 600, the existing law on that, um, unless there's a real good justification for not doing that because we're at a sweep making everything on the lake that meets the over the 480 uh, non-conforming right then and there. I think the public comment was referring to Lake Sammamish also. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I thought with Lake Sammamish we were looking at making it consistent with the core. No. No? We reduced all of them. Well, I, I guess I'd like to ask sure. for comment on that and see if anybody else has a concern about it because I don't, you know, making everything non-conforming is something that we've tried very hard not to do in this process. Well, this was the direction we arrived at at the July 7th meeting. Were we grandfathering the old and, and this was just new? That was what I remembered. Yeah, I think uh, what I understand is that you were... I don't know. I'm asking for clarification. Mm -hmm. That's why it's mm -hmm. a question. And maybe we should have added that to the uh, policy direction, but I think it's a general policy that the council has had about grandfathering existing uses. I think we apply that to, to docks as well. And I, and I think in the case of the repair that you've identified there, um, I think we could, we could make policy such that you could repair an existing dock that was larger than the standard size. I think we're talking about for new docks, they would be limited to the 480. And I think there were two motivations there. One is that under that RGP3, that is the core limitation. Now, one can exceed that with a special authorization, um, but uh, that is the standard um, that the core allows on Lake Sammamish. And that was also consistent with our peer jurisdictions that we showed in the table that we used last time. So as the council decide, uh, discussed and decided it, it was uh, arrived out to use that 480. So if uh, the core is at 480, unless you go under the this, the other review process, right? But if we restrict it to 480, then the other review process is not open to property owners. It would be the upper limit for new docks. For yeah. new docks. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a concern about that, but I don't know if anybody on the council wants to go back and revisit that. Well, uh, we will hear public comment after the plan is drafted up. Uh, we're, we're, our intent is to draft the plan per this city council policy direction from all the different meetings. Um, and then, yes, uh, the mayor's correct. You would hear additional public comment. And then the council can amend that plan, either restore 600 or go with another figure on that or any other, any other item from the, uh, from the SMP. Okay. I had, yes. I had a couple more questions about just summarizing all of this that I know we've discussed at various times but I'm not sure it's reflected in here or if we actually reach decisions uh, one's a simple one um, we talked about docks being an outright permitted use uh, associated with single-family homes um, mm -hmm. a lot of us found the language that would have made docks available only if ne needed for moorage to be uh, too limiting, especially on Pine and Beaver, where you know we don't usually moor our bo dock boats on the dock. We usually pull them up because they're small, non-motorized type of things, ex with the exception of some of the barges and stuff. Um, so, has that language? Do you have direction on that to take that out of there to change that? Pretty sure we do. I'm going to look to yeah. Margaret's nodding her head yes, so that is correct. Okay. And then the third point I had was on the replacement of docks. You had on the alternatives, um, a whole bunch of, you know, very creative, I guess, replacement. If you had 30% damage, you had to do this, and you, if you had so much, you had to replace your pilings. Uh, it would have created a lot of expense. Um, did we specifically address that and give you direction on that? When the charts changed and we started looking at the Sammamish homeowners, I don't rec rec recall that we readdressed that, but I do think that's well, If you look at the uh, next page on your on your city council policy direction, I'm glad Margaret's joined me, but I'm going to read through. This is what the direction from June 16th hey, was. Um, this, is, this is on Exhibit 1, uh -huh. page 2 of 3, okay. about two and a half inches down. Mm -hmm. This is under council policy direction from June 16th. It's below the solid line that goes across thank you and it's the one two three four fifth bullet down um wdfw approved materials are required for all dock repairs requiring permits 
So that was the threshold. If you needed a permit, you needed to use the proper materials. If you didn't need a permit, then you could. But even if we needed a permit, we're not still limited to using all the new materials. We're just consistent with the regulations? Consistent <laughs> with the with the state approved materials there. We didn't adopt any different ones specific to Sammamish. We stayed with the state approved list. And as that list evolves over time, then our, our list would adapt. So if we remove the top of the dock, we don't have to do anything with the pilings? Am I interpreting that correctly? I think that's correct. I mean, before we would have had to have done something with the pilings too. Right, so I think this is a little more liberal now. If, you're, if you need a permit, then you have to use the WDFW materials, but you would only be repairing, of course, what you needed to repair. Okay. Thank you. Other questions on that first page? I had one. One of the uh, citizens brought up the priority for, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh down, remove bulkhead. Uh, oh, no. Uh, no action, allow the shoreline to retreat naturally would be the preferred and then increase building setback and then number three use a flexible defense works constructed of natural materials I didn't recall us giving direction in that order um, I, I made a note here when I read it check the video of the meeting <laughs> it just doesn't sound like uh, we had given that direction No, I recall that and the no action was the listed as number one priority and we just works. agreed with that you just agreed with it uh -huh. without discussion, is that it? Right. Uh -huh. Well, this, this, I'm just being informed, it looks like this might be an error here, so I apologize for that. We'll have to get review the tape ourselves, and if, if we've got it wrong, we'll, we'll make sure it, it gets right there. Okay. Is I know right? we went through a lot of different discussion points along all of that there, and I'm visualizing the policy the summary number. document in my head right now, um, and then I think we went through and decided on the homeowner's preferred list. And so that's probably what should be there. And I apologize if I didn't edit this properly here. Okay, then the next bullet point where we, when considering repair or replacement of shoreline stabilization, uh, we have an order of priority there. Remove bulkhead, place fill, vegetate leave bulkhead place fill vegetate or vegetate water side of the bulkhead and I I wonder what the implication of having a priority is there um, do we tell people that uh, you have to remove the bulkhead you can't vegetate on the water side or what does well, the priority it mean it wasn't the intent I mean it, you'd have all those tools there um, if you had to replace the bulkhead there would be need for, no need for the other other ones that are there uh -huh. so they're listed in order of preference because of the ecological benefits you would get by removing the bulkhead and if you were able to use a um, essentially biostabilization technique successfully there without the bulkhead um, then that would be the preferred method. If you still needed to have the bulkhead, if the erosion was so um, severe, if the soil types were so erodible, if the circumstances really uh, required that, then that would be an available option. Uh, you still got to deal with whatever fill or vegetation to try to make it as environmentally friendly as, as, you, as you can. Um, it's just listed in order of preference for what's best for the environment. Mm -hmm. Now that's listed for all lakes, um, but if you think in terms of Pine and Beaver Lake, uh, bulkheads really aren't the, uh, the onerous uh, entity that they are on Lake Sammamish. Uh, and uh, a citizen asked me the other day, uh, pointing to a deteriorating bulkhead, uh, and asked, well, under the new SMP, will I not be able to replace that with a, a new bulkhead once it deteriorates? And I didn't know an answer to that. Well, I think we'd have to look at the circumstance. I don't want to make an individual, yeah. you know, permit decision here. At no, a council but in meeting. general, uh, we're going to allow re replacements of bulkheads. Uh, <laughs> I think we can allow. Re yeah, I, I want to be careful about this and and not um, over promise or under promise here. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think it is possible for under the right circumstances either a bulkhead to be remain in place or be repaired. Mm -hmm. 
I hope that answers the question. Well, we didn't. We didn't grandfather that, so that it was. An didn't automatic. grandfather like if, like like with a dockers or right. something else? You didn't mm -hmm. say well because there's a bulkhead there will always be one. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd make the observation that I think you're correct, Mr. Mayor, that you don't have the same habitat issues, but the, there are problems with bulkheads, especially in isolation. In that even on a small lake, the wave refraction can affect adjacent properties. So. The difficulty is the partially bulkheaded <laughs> situation is, is can have other effects on other portions of, of property. That's property. true, but having lived in Pine Lake for 30 years, um, I recognize that basically around the shoreline, most of the shoreline is muck. Um, and if you don't have a bulkhead and you pull up to the shore, in fact, I had a neighbor some 25 years ago that used to, every spring, take his outboard motor on his boat, rev it up, uh, pointing inward so that he would blow all the silt out into the lake so, so his beach would be okay. Um, he doesn't live there anymore, so I'm okay telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> and there are no motors for life. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, but, but the point is that with a bulkhead, you can actually bring uh, a boat up to the bulkhead or a party barge up to the bulkhead rather than dragging it up the muck and stirring up all the phosphorus which is in the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe Margaret has some input on that. Uh, well, the relative value of bulkheads on, on the smaller lakes. The v value of bulkheads in terms of their... Ver versus uh, so-called natural shoreline. I guess I'm wondering if it's muck, why is it eroding? <laughs> oh, I didn't say it was eroding. Okay, but you put a bulkhead to deal with erosion. Bulkhead's failing? Yeah, the bulkhead's failing. I'm happy to have Margaret. <laughs> I, I was just going to offer that um, the draft that we're working on with staff in response to the Planning Commission direction as well as the, the Sammamish homeowner draft allows for replacement of existing bulkheads. So um, repair and replacement of existing bulkheads is allowed as a uh, outright okay. use. So, okay. and that that's applies to all the lakes. Great, thank you. Any other questions on that first page? Okay, the second page of notes, which are um, 16th and July 21st notes. Any comments on that? <coughs> okay, uh, page three of three. Oh, I do. Okay, Nancy. The Pine and Beaver Lake subdivision widths, it's, we agreed on 50 feet. Um, wasn't that, does this properly reflect the direction we gave? It was 50 feet down at the water, so there's no new waterfront lot, as I recall. I'm not sure this properly expresses that. I think that's correct. That's a proper statement that um, it was 50 feet at the, at the water's edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a lot of discussion about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but that Our next bullet down sort of gets to that point, two too. I, I wanted to um, comment on the um, di policy direction that the council had on page three of three, all lakes uh, for uh, vegetation requirements and this is to move from 45 feet to 20 feet, is that right? Uh, 45 feet could go down to uh, 15 feet mm -hmm. with a five-foot building setback. Okay. Um, we've heard comment earlier that um, with uh, additional shoreline vegetation enhancement, the, the Army Corps was al allowing people to go to 600 square foot docks, but they what we would actually be doing here is simply saying that uh, for moving your house from 45 feet to 20 feet, you could also have a bigger dock if we were to go back to 600 square feet. I'm not opposed to a 600 square feet being on uh, Pine and Beaver Lakes under general principle that we're not a uh, threat. Um, uh, there isn't the environmental consequences to uh, threatened and endangered uh, species that there is on Lake Sammamish. But I would not like to have a shoreline master plan that simply uh, had the same vegetation counted for uh, dock expansion as uh, for uh, moving houses closer to the lake. So that's why I support having the language in the direction that we did have here 
and that's why having the 480 square foot docks is there. If you were to consider going to 600 square foot docks, I'd want us to have an analysis that showed whether we're getting anything at all in uh, addition to that, the dock expansion for moving the house what forward. What about um, taking out a bulkhead? I mean, that seems to me the incentives were... But if that's part of what the Army Corps would uh, consider as the mitigation for the expanded dock, then you're getting the same bulkhead removal to move the house 25 feet closer to the lake as you are to expand the dock. And if, the, if that's going to be our policy, that's our policy. But I would want the council to understand that in the instance where you might consider expanded docks on the Lake Sammamish, that there is the potential that our uh, mitigation for moving the house 25 feet closer to the lake is, in fact, what you, the same mitigation you'd use to expand the dock. Yeah, I think that's, that's my good, comment. Good the, other, the other comment I have is that we heard a characterization from a uh, citizen that the uh, Bellevue uh, Shoreline Master Plan was illegal. That may be their own opinion, but I'm not aware that there are any legal findings in a court of law here in the state of Washington I don't think it was determining the, that. The shoreline, was it the CAO? CAO. <coughs> it was the yeah. CAO. It was the CAO. And <coughs> I still don't think that there is a no, court of case that characterizes it that way. Being characterized. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on page three? I think I had a, a question, Cameron, where it says all lakes. Um, the third point down, allow an active use area that is up to 25% of the shoreline enhancement area and no less than 15 feet of the lot width. I, I think that verbi verbiage could be better expressed, but in any case, no less than uh, 15 feet or something like that. Sure. And this is intended to be a, a bullet point as opposed right. to a policy statement. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next page is Exhibit 2. This is the Urban Conservancy parcel information. Any comments about the parcel information? That, you showed that on your slides. I did. Uh, what you did say is um, under all lakes, two of these are public park lots, two are beach club lots, and you're proposing to change beach club lots from rural to urban conservancy? Uh, are those undeveloped beach club lots? Is that what that means? I, I don't understand why we would have urban conservancy for beach club lots. Well, again, uh, they have, may have been. Uh, I don't. I don't know that these were undeveloped entirely, but they were used in use as beach clubs. They may have, and they should be, within a stretch or reach of shoreline, I where see. you had a common, or essentially <laughs> relatively common conditions, and that's where urban conservancy was applied. It would not surprise me that a beach club lot would be larger. It would probably be found in an area of larger lots, and that's why it. It was uh, it was shown there. Uh, the restriction there um, again. The, your policy choices here, I think tonight, are uh, whether you want to confirm what you've told us before about the limitations on docks and subdivisions. Those are the remaining distinctions between urban conservancy and shoreline residential. Mm -hmm. um, I'd make the observation that if we decide to. Uh, confirm the current direction, which is no additional limitations for urban conservancy. The staff are going to think hard about whether we're going to retain urban conservancy as a designation uh, for any um, private lots. We'll have to think about whether we want to retain that for the publicly owned lots or use some other other designation. Um, but uh, the differences become. Diminutive. Diminimus. <laughs> yeah. That was a good word that Lee used in the last meeting. <laughs> um, well, we did have public comment on the definition of urban conservancy, too. I, I just had a question on uh, bullet number three under general information estimates. The total, the seven lots that are moving from rural to urban <coughs> conservancy, two are parks, two are beach club, two are residential. What's 
the last one. Well, now it looks like we've got six. two plus two plus <laughs> two is six. I don't know. Um, and let's see if the staff. That question is on the math list. Okay. Apologize. Okay. Either our math is wrong or six. something something fell off the list there. I, I, and I, I don't mean to belabor the point here. I think the reason that we're asking you to think about this is that we are trying to keep mind of no net loss. And if um, an objective reviewer or the Department of Ecology were to see a change from uh, two designations of rural and conservancy go to a single designation of shoreline residential uh, with a standard set of regulations across the entire um, area there. Um, I'm not sure that that meets our test. And I, th I think we have to think hard about whether that does. Um, we have to we have to make sure in our shoreline master program that the baseline conditions that exist when we started would be retained um, through a developed state. That means you develop the rest of the property, whether it's a little cabin that gets replaced with a full-size house, whether it's a vacant lot that gets developed, and, and that would happen under our zoning code, would not result in a, in a net loss. And so we have to preserve those baseline conditions. We do that through two, and, and the, the test now is that we actually have to restore over time. Um, and, and that's where our restoration plan comes in. How do we ensure baseline conditions? Well, we do it through these regulatory tools. So we're trying to figure out, and the city, I think, has been a leader in trying to do incentive-based tools. Our lake buffers, uh, as a good example that we did through our critical areas ordinance, we're essentially trying to replicate that here. Um, but I would observe that there is a qualitative difference between urban conservancy and how that those stretches have been developed over time, at least since 1978, um, and their current state, and the balance of the city. Um, so we are talking about, and if my numbers are correct here, 70 lots out of, I think it's over 600 lots in the city that are under shoreline uh, designation, shoreline jurisdiction. So perhaps 11%. Uh, Eleven and a half percent of the lots would be proposed for urban conservancy, and the net <laughs> result difference would be a few less subdivided lots and a handful of fewer docks. And I don't mean to be insensitive to the individual owners and, and their concerns about that, um, but the big trend has been to move from er the old conservancy designation. A, a large number of old conservancy lots are now proposed for shoreline residential. Um, and so you're really just talking about a remaining portion there. And I'm trying to manage this issue of no net loss for, for the city. So that's why I'm asking you to think about this before you um, make a decision. By the Mark. way, that number should be uh, three public park lots, two beach lots, and two single family lots. Ah, I see, okay, so. And when you look below. So if we were to look at a map um, of where those 70 shoreline lots are, we would see them in bunches. You would. And, and uh, you know, I've got a few PowerPoint slides if we want to look at them for illustrative purposes. And certainly when we go back through your public hearing, we'll zero in on the individual lots that are proposed for change. And I can very much understand an argument when you're sort of at the end of a designation. That's what happened in the case of Mr. Smith and Mr. Martin, is that they were right at the end. In fact, they were at the very end of the cities, at the city limits up there. Um, and so uh, that's where I can see reasonable people sort of arguing about that. What's tougher is within a long <coughs> reach um, to see that in the middle. larger yeah. larger change. Yeah. yeah, those maps are in the our original do, uh, Planning Commission Yeah, version. I thought we had seen them someplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mark? Um, Cameron, uh, I understand your, your admonition against making the, some changes. The Planning Commission did make a recommendation to us that included two of them going to the higher density urban residential. Right? Shoreline residential. Shoreline residential. And it's, there's, it's not higher density. The only real difference, because um, the zoning doesn't change. This is a shoreline designation, as you know, that's, that's changing. The Planning Commission had recommended three substantive differences between shoreline residential and urban conservancy. One was impervious surface. The council's already uh, decided to Not stay easy. with the citywide standard. 
Two was a limitation of, on docs, which is in today's Shoreline Master Program, so that would continue that into the, the new one. And the third is a restriction on subdivisions. And there is not an outright restriction, but there is a similar de facto restriction for conservancy uh, designated uh, lots in today's SMP. So it's kind of a, in Can my view, kind of a perpetuation. Hang on. The, the, the question I had is that their recommendation also included moving a couple of lots, particularly the two at the north. Didn't, didn't their recommendation include moving and changing the designation of yes. three lots? Uh, those two, um, and if you look at, again, um, your exhibit two, uh, kind of in the <coughs> middle there, and I had a slide on this, for Lake Sammamish, we had conservancy, the old designation to shoreline residential, the new designation, 43 lots, three by homeowner request to planning commission. So the two that we've talked about tonight and a third one that I'm, I'm not sure where it existed, but right. there was also true. I guess my, uh, my personal uh, um, choice was to support the planning commission because I know they looked at these lots and the designations carefully. And uh, unless I heard convincing you know, ideas some other way the, to follow their recommendation, including the changing of those three <coughs> lots in their designation. Now, is there something about what the Planning Commission has recommended to us that you, your admonition about being careful and making the changes, or is there something about the Planning Commission recommendation that you feel we should look at carefully? Well, I, that's why I was pointing us towards Exhibit 3. Um, and if you want to turn to that page, it's easiest to give you an answer by looking at that page. This is where we have the two rows, UC1 and UC2. UC1 has those under the PC recommended draft SMP column, those three bullet points are the three issues that are the distinguishing points between urban conservancy and shoreline residential. <coughs> right. These are the limitations or restrictions or prohibitions, if whatever you want to call them, within that PC recommended draft. Yeah, under UC2, they have um, Planning Commission made the following changes, urban conservancy to shoreline residential, Martin and Smith, and then from Shoreline Residential to Urban Conservancy, Anderson. That's the one, UC2, that I was asking you to, to comment on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, of those, no, I don't see a reason to uh, revisit those. And I, th I, think, uh, I think we've heard testimony that from the owners that would be in favor of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't see why we would revisit the individual changes that the Planning Commission made. It's more on UC1 on the overall policy. Right. Thank you. Well, I have a comment on the, the no net loss issue with regard to docs. Uh, what we've learned is that the, uh, the state is requiring using new materials and new design to docs so that uh, uh, really, if you think about it, and we had discussions on this before, a dock is better for the shoreline than no dock because if you have no dock and you have a boat, you're going to pull it up to the shoreline. And if you're trying to have uh, shoreline vegetation and spawning areas for <coughs> kokanee or, or what, whatever fish on the shoreline, you're much better having your motorized boats going to a dock, especially on Lake Sammamish where you have gas-driven gas boats. So we should ban boats? Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so the point I, I'm making is I feel that uh, having a dock is not uh, a net loss of ecological function. In fact, it's going to enhance the ecological function over not having a dock and abusing the shoreline by pulling the boats up. And so that's my comment on the, the dock issue. Uh, with regard to the subdivision, well, I, I think there are only three cases, did you say? And um, Three parcels would be affected. Um, it's a handful of lots, probably, I don't, I don't know if we ever came up with a lot and, count. And, and the comment I had made previously on that is that basically we're, we're denying the last comers. Everybody else is uh, subdivided and, and now the people that hadn't before are going to be declared uh, conservancy. Um, Mark and then Nancy. Uh, Don, I'm going to disagree with you on uh, people who have lakefront lots and uh, don't have a dock. They may pull their boat up onto the lakefront property uh, during the summer months when they're most likely to want to use the, the boat. 
During the winter months, uh, when there's the, the wave action and winter uh, changes in the water elevation and a lot of wind and storms, people who have, do not have a dock don't tend to overwinter their boat by simply pulling it up onto the beach, uh, particularly a, a ski boat. Uh, they're either going to winter it by uh, being out on a buoy mm -hmm. or by taking it out of the lake. And those are the precise times when the fish window for Lake Sammamish shows us that the fish uh, salmon are active in the lake looking to move right along the very edge and by not having a boat or a dock during the winter on those lakefront properties there's no shading, no shadow and no advantage to the predator species in the lake. So I'm going to disagree with you on that. Fair enough. It's it's not a black and white issue. I, I used to water ski all winter long there but uh, uh, I know some people pulled the boats out. Nancy? Hi, question. Uh, I can see on Lake Sammamish where you can argue both sides of the dock issue. But when you get to Pine and Beaver Lake, we don't really have any fish we're trying to preserve, especially any endangered or whatever fish. Um, so why the dock restriction on Pine and Beaver Lake? Especially if you have a lake with a mucky bottom. Uh, docks are an extension uh, for recreational purposes of the use of your property. Uh, even if it's an urban conservancy, <coughs> um, why on the smaller lakes would you put a dock limitation? Well, I suppose uh, one thing would be just to be consistent across the different lakes so we have a consistent policy direction would be one reason. I would observe that, I, you know, the habitat isn't just for salmon. Habitat is for all the species we're trying to, to protect here. So, you know, I, I, would, I would, you know, what I'm reading out of the science um, is, yes, docks can prevent the issue that the mayor is talking about. I think Councilmember Cross has a good point too in that they are a fixed impact. And certainly where the pilings are and where the shading is, it, it exists year round. So I think whoever made the comment about it not being black and white, you're correct. Um, it's your policy uh, choice there. I think uh, conservancy has been a designation and that's been implemented since 1978. So that's, um, my math is correct on that, 31 years. Um, slightly longer than Don has been living on <laughs> on, on uh, Pine Lake. Um, to save the lake. Uh, it hasn't done anything to save the lake, I mean, from development. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that, that, that statement, but I, I'd be happy to answer a question. Can I make a comment then? I, you know, um, you can't show a justification for Pine and Beaver Lake except consistency and the lakes are different and the, what you're trying to protect is different. Yeah. The habitats are different so I don't think we should have a dock restriction on Pine and Beaver Lakes um, if for any lot that is designated as conservancy. Um, I do see you can argue it either way on Lake Sammamish. I think Mark made some very good points and I think the mayor made some uh, interesting although less persuasive points oh. to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, I think, so, you know, I would ask this council to consider removing the dock restriction on urban conservancy in Pine and Beaver Lakes. Um, the 200-foot uh, placement might be reasonable, but I mean, my goodness, the one thing that really would have saved these lots would have been impervious surface limitations. And I think we not unanimously, uh, that were stricter than... Um, citywide ones and I think we unanimously said not to do that because it was too restrictive. So I th would ask that uh, we do consider removing the dock limitation, <coughs> the no dock limitation uh, or, um, or the no 200 feet dock limitation on these lots for the smaller lakes. Michelle, you had a comment? Well, I, I just don't understand why we're going through all of this for two lots, uh, the Urban Conservancy, unless we're going to go back and rule on the ones that the Planning Commission have still, I mean, there's 40 no, some. No, it's not just two lots that are designated for urban conservancy. There are 60 or so, 60 or 70 lots designate, or proposed yeah, but, for that but designation. but most of those have been recommended to be changed to shoreline residential. No, 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 no. Uh, 70 remaining. Yeah, Michelle, th remaining. there's only uh, three that uh, could be subdivided. Isn't, isn't that the issue? That's, that's correct. Right. So yeah, for... Exactly. For bullet point one, the difference between conservancy and residential, bullet point one, the subdivision restriction only applies to three lots. Three out of 70, that's right. Three out of 70. Bullet point two is the one we're talking about right now, whether docks are really 
uh, uh, net loss of ecological function or not, the pros and cons of that. And the third bullet point we've already dealt with. So if we come to a consensus on docks uh, that they aren't that harmful, then we might as well throw out the whole urban conservancy uh, designation because there is no difference then. The subdivision. Except for, except for three lots, the ones that could be subdivided. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? I'm not willing to go forward and uh, make a change to that. So that we essentially void the urban conservancy. Uh, okay. Do you want to? I would, I'd, like to I'd like to retain the dock limitations. I don't <coughs> want to essentially gut the urban conservancy so that we no longer have that designation. How about the part about subdivision? I'm comfortable with that. I mean, it, it only applies to three lots, essentially, we think. You're comfortable uh, with leaving it in or taking I'm it out? comfortable with leaving it in. We don't know at this point how many lots it's going to affect. We think it's going to affect only three, but we don't know. But I would prefer to leave it in because until we make that decision. <coughs> I'm, I'd comment, I guess, that uh, I don't want to leave uh, three lots on, on Lake Sammamish specifically. Uh, as the w only ones on the lake that don't have the right to subdivide, um, given that we do require um, that subdivisions be found to be in the public interest and the controls that we have there, and given the direction that the council gave last time about 480 square foot docks, I'm comfortable that if there were subdivisions that it did include the creation of a new waterfront lot, that uh, the smaller docks are uh, not going to be as, as <coughs> impactful. So I, I guess I would uh, not support uh, a limitation on three lots only um, being um, prohibited <coughs> from <coughs> subdivision. Well, I th the reason I'm willing to stay with that for now is that at this point it's only a guesstimate. We really don't know what the number is. And I'm hoping that by September we might have more information that people would step forward and provided more information on their lots. I, so I thought we knew that there's only three that. We think that that's the staff's best estimate of what the effect would be. Best estimate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just so we're clear, it's we have. Five. It's still. Just so we're clear, the urban conservancy um, areas about 70 lots out of 600 plus. Um, the distinction is really in these two areas. So if those distinctions are taken away, then what the staff will do is reconsider whether we want to hold on to that designation. If we don't want to hold on to that designation, we'd go to a single designation or we think figure out another designation for the public lands. Maybe that's an appropriate thing. Um, and and revise the document accordingly. So I'm, I'm looking for you to someone to I, I'm in Close favor of, I, I don't think there's enough there to, to keep it intact. I just assumed see it all be shoreline residential and with the other restrictions that we've put in place through this SMP process, they'll all be consistent in terms of development of docks and development and setbacks and shoreline enhancement areas and, and it's all the same. That's the way I feel. You know, I did look at the Redmond SMP now that I knew it was uh, approved by the DOE. And the way they addressed the designation of lots along Lake Sammamish is they said Lake Sammamish shoreline is shoreline residential, except those associated wetlands at the north end of, of the lake, and those are urban conservancy. So basically, they identify wetlands as urban conservancy. And everything else is shoreline residential, uh, they, uh, which is more in step with what uh, one of the citizens gave us as the, the details of the, uh, the Washington, right, and the, the WAC. critical areas piece, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the other point about uh, subdivision now is we are putting all these restrictions on the shoreline when you build new. Right. You have to have the uh, the proper shoreline uh, enhancements. So it's not like uh, a subdivision where we uh, clear cut the trees and everything. Or maybe we want to go back and think about other 
m mitigation enhancement things people would be willing to do if we could incent everybody all 600 lots to do something versus penalize the three um, you know I'd rather be proactive that way than restrictive this way hmm. so. the incentives are proposed to be for all lots yeah mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Nancy um, at this point in time I am uh, I think as <coughs> Cameron pointed out we need as we go forward to protect and preserve we need to enhance um, we're stewards of our environment and <coughs> while we don't want unnecessary restrictions we need to look to the future and protecting the resources we have for the benefit of future generations um, if people living on the lake and the lakes go bad on us uh, become unswimmable or whatever because of phosphorus loading or so forth uh, if Lake Sammamish loses its fish like um, the early fall early runs of kokanee became extinct <coughs> in Eberite Creek uh, what do we leave for the future so um, I think we need to leave the Urban Conservancy designation on these lots um, and, uh, but I think the approach we need to take in protecting our water resources needs to be basin wide I don't think we can stop and take a look and say well we've done all we have to do um, by putting a five-foot vegetation strip which I don't think will do anything for our lakes I think we need to look basin wide and as they said it's an equity issue uh, things like LID to be basin wide we need to review uh, the impacts on the lakes looking at it holistically um, but I think in the meantime what the purpose of the urban conservancy is to say these are set aside they're unique lots they still have something that's in a more natural condition and worth preserving how can we do that I think we need to do it in a basin wide context that's why I didn't approve separate impervious surface limitations for these lots I think we need to look at say see holistically basin wide do we need to review our surface limitations um, so I'm uh, but I do think the designation even if it has no substance to it um, even if we took out the docks and the uh, uh, other provision that's impacting this the subdivision requirement I still think that the designation itself is a recognition that these are unique properties that are left and that they're worth preserving and whether you do it through incentives or whatever I still think that designation is a recognition uh, that in the no net loss standard these are you know something that we don't have to uh, retrofit to get them up there so I, I, I'm uncomfortable with removing the designation however we deal with the docks issue uh, or the subdivision issue I think the subdivision issue is something that we should maybe come back and revisit at some point in time but I'm not uh, you know when we remove the surf impervious surface limitations I'm not comfortable with all the changes we've made in the other areas t to removing the designation or to um, uh, doing away with the subdivision limitation I, I think we have something we're saving worth preserving and I think we need to look to the future and I think that this process has been driven by those with a present interest and I think that's good I think that's necessary but I think we also need to be guardians for the future and I don't think we're doing that if we just do away with everything okay so I think we have two points of view I've heard one point of view that we do away with urban conservancy and the other that we don't do away with it uh, others would you like to weigh in well, the, what I've been struggling with is, is, uh, is I guess Nancy brought up the word, and it's a good, it's a good word, uh, substance. Uh, what I've been struggling with is what kind of substantial protection do we get from the urban conservancy definition? You know, I, I think every one of us would agree that we do want to look for the future, and we want to have provisions that are protective where that's appropriate. Uh, what, what has been troubling me on this, it seems like we have two layers of regulation. Uh, and if there's some elements of the urban conservancy that are, have merit and have substance, wouldn't it be more effective to include those in the one layer of regulation rather than having two layers? And so I'm, I'm, I'm troubled with this. It seems like, I guess I haven't heard a real substantial argument that this is really giving us a lot of meat inside the hamburger. Yeah. And, and if there are a couple of points that are useful and valuable for protecting that future legacy, then would it be more effective to incorporate that in the base document? Yeah. I 
agree. You're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> it's partly a rhetorical question, okay. but uh, I, I would certainly be interested in your comment. Well, I think just an observation, and I'll repeat um, that the shoreline zone, the incentives for the ins enhancement area in terms of the reduction of that shoreline zone for doing various beneficial things are proposed to be uniformly true for either shoreline residential or urban conservancy. So we have taken the approach that I think I heard both um, Michelle and, and you advocate um, to um, you know, be fair, be consistent, and try to get um, ecological friendliness and enhancement in, in every context. I think the, uh, what I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I'm not coming up with anything, but, I, but I'll, I could pledge to continue to think about this with some additional horsepower, um, is whether by retaining the Urban Conservancy designation, we could try to seek to either preserve the characteristics that are there today in a little more effective manner through some additional incentives is what I'm, what I'm thinking about, um, as opposed to an additional set of restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a way for retaining urban conservancy, retaining the functions and values that are there on those lots, um, and still being fair to the, to the property owners. I, I can't cite you what those would be, but that would, I think, be in harmony with your overall approach that I've heard the council articulate. So I'd be happy to think about that and see if we could come up with something if, if that's a way of somehow <laughs> splitting the baby here. <laughs> we have a couple more uh, comments. One, one uh, compromise between the two um, positions would be to keep the designation, um, allow for subdivision, but to require that uh, new docks be joint use docks so that properties, lands that are being subdivided could subdivide, but that they would have to <coughs> have joint use docks okay. rather than multiple individual docks. And that would allow us to reduce the waterfront, shoreline, uh, habitat impact of subdivision, still retain uh, more of the natural vegetation along the lake, but still allow people to subdivide the property and, and create those additional lots so that we don't single out three properties uh, for uh, special treatment or special, you know, restrictions on subdivision, but at the same time focus our efforts on keeping uh, docks and the uh, limits on docks as a, a, an important environmental feature in these areas. Well, Mark, that I might so. work, uh, but yeah. if the if the conditions are such that the joint dock cannot be placed on the property line, that it has to be inside or several feet from one property line versus the other. Well, we'd have to remove that restriction. I said, depending upon what the shoreline conditions are, you may not be able oh. to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that I'm willing to say that everybody who is uh, in that area has to share a dock with somebody else. I think that sets up uh, potential conflicts between neighbors who have to share that dock, and I don't, I don't think that's our business. In, in if you set it up with subdivision, if property owners have property and they choose to subdivide, mm -hmm. the, they could arrange for a joint use dock. Uh, all the time people give access to their lakefront property for multiple lots you know, and create an easement to allow joint access across a lakefront edge. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly on the shoreline border between the two created lots, but certainly they could allow uh, and we could require joint use of docks rather than the creation of a multiple additional docks when subdivision occurs in these areas that we know previously have had uh, less development. The notion reminds me yeah. of condos on Lake Washington that have one shared dock for many units. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Cameron, can you take that as a head nodding to try to get creative on a joint use dock? Yeah, I, would, I think Mark is correct about how that would happen for a new subdivision. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way of, of uh, approaching this. Okay, but then if the docks still have to be 200 feet apart, 
you I, might. I think that's you're replacing the 200 feet with the requirement for joint use. Yeah, yeah that, that would, would be, be my replacing. That'd be my goal. And certainly, <laughs> Kathy's point that there may be environmental constraints that, that where the dock has to be located. Now it's something that the subdivider would have to work out in advance in the subdivision process. That's okay for subdivisions, but what about the other urban conservancy? They still have to have them 200 feet apart. Is that it? Uh, for the existing lots that are not being subdivided, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Either you retain the 200 feet or you drop that or... Mm hmm Yes, Nancy? Uh, you know, it gets to be the, the height of the ridiculous. Um, this is sort of like a health department regulation on wells. You have to have a 100-foot setback. If there's a pre-existing well on your neighbor's lot, you can't build within 100 feet of that, even if there's no covenant or easement on your property. Um, that leads, uh, I had a client whose house burned down, the neighbor had put in a well and they didn't have the 100-foot restriction, my client couldn't rebuild. Uh, in this situation, if you have somebody who's uh, adjacent to an urban conservancy uh, that's urban residential, they put in their own dock because they have a right to uh, their lots more than 30 feet wide and um, they don't have a 200 foot restriction but their neighbor on the left does. You're letting what goes on around uh, these people outside of their control con con uh, mandate the outcome of whether they can have a dock or not and I don't think that's good government. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't I have a concern about the 200 feet. I don't think it should apply to Pine and Beaver Lake. And um, I don't like the way it would impact owners on Lake Sammamish, where, as I said, somebody could come in, put a dock on an adjacent residential lot with no restrictions, and basically uh, force their neighbors not to have a dock if it's a new one. Any other comments on this? Do we have a consensus on this 200-foot restriction one? To throw it out? To throw it out. What I'm hearing, Mr. Mayor, is that you would drop the 200-foot restriction. Um, you would drop the restriction on subdivision. Um, you would introduce a new um, requirement for joint use talks for any subdivided property with an urban conservancy. Mm -hmm. I would retain my offer to think about whether there's some other more incentive-based ideas we could float out there and see if mm -hmm. see okay. If that are makes we all sense. okay with that? Uh, uh, yeah. Nancy's got a Nancy, can can you when you're creative uh, balance maybe the right to have a dock for these people if it's a single-family dock um, on a smaller urban conservancy lot be balanced against vegetation management and other things that might be uh, or impervious surface limitations something that. Mm -hmm. might give value to preserving the habitat, whatever that might be. Okay, well, we'll see what I can do I mean, to maybe we, mix it It doesn't have to stuff. be, the docks could be a carrot, a big carrot for these people, um, that if they did enough on the upland to keep the natural state, maybe they could get the dock, uh, you know. Is that something the council would support if I went into you that really area? Look at it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Before your vacation? Yes. At your deferred vacation past September 22nd? <laughs> <laughs> I retain hope here. <laughs> okay, I, I think you've given me your policy direction on this unless somebody has another change or no. observation. Okay. And um, council willing to go with the staff recommendation for ordinary high water mark that we would? Yes. Undertake yes. scoping our own study. When do you think oh. that study will be completed? Well, um, I. Is that something you're going to do soon, or Ben, ben has the money to pay for this somewhere, so uh, <laughs> maybe he should. Uh, well, uh, uh, the goal is that Kathy, we, we try to get this thing scoped <coughs> in the September, October time frame, and then they get the study done, hopefully in November, and then to bring it to the council in. But that's fine because December we don't have to have January. it before. This is done. Yeah, there's no way we can get it done before uh, the SMP is adopted. So uh, here's here's the uh, the the uh, the dilemma and or the or the issue that we will be dealing till we determine that the high water mark with our own study, we will be asking 
practically every homeowner to complete their own studies, and that would be uh, every applicant, not every homeowner, but every applicant wants to get some permit from the city. That we had, they have to complete their own study, and we would have to do that individual reviews. Have many in the pipeline? Do I have anything? Do we have many in the, any people in the pipeline? Do we have any many shoreline permit related activity in the pipeline? I think that's Kathy's asking. No. No, not many. I mean, there's, there's not much in terms of new single-family development generally. Um, I'm sure there is the occasional right. shoreline permit. Um, docks, which would be I, um, no activity on docks or anything that would be affected by the ordinary high water mark, because that would be pretty expensive for each homeowner to. Yep. Yeah. Well, we currently currently are using the 28.18. We've been using right. that since okay. January so that 2000. Would still be in play. Six. Uh, so that is an available default number of someone right. who didn't want to do their, and we do, we authorize them to do their to do their own study if they choose to do that. Okay. So my recommendation is status quo on that till we get our, our study La done. Last week, uh, Ben and I went down to the DOE office in Bellevue with some of the citizens and met with uh, well at least three, I think four DOE officials were there, and we <coughs> talked about this doing doing our own study. And uh, the question was asked, how long would it take to do a study? And uh, the DOE, uh, this was Eric that said, uh, oh, a week of field work and a week to write it up. And then I said, and a week for DOE to approve? <laughs> and uh, they didn't necessarily agree to that. Uh, but I think in the discussion, we talked about how this study might get done. And um, I, I, the citizens and I had some concerns with the way the, the Bellevue study got done. And I couldn't, after reading the Bellevue study, I couldn't tell how many independent observers went out and made judgment calls on the actual ordinary high water mark, you know, saying, well, the debris line was here. Was it just one person that did that? Or were there a couple of consultants that did it? And, and that was my concern, because it, when you talk about peer review, uh, part of it is uh, peer review of the observations. And so, uh, one possible way of doing this, and actually the DOE suggested that uh, they might have someone that'd be willing to go out and, and review the, the raw data. Isn't that the way you interpret this? That's, that's what I got too, and then the other part of it is also that I would make sure that um, um, the, we need to get the homeowners to be involved from the beginning of the study, and then as well as the Department of Ecology. Ecology is going to be the approving authority on this thing. And we need to get them involved. So the worst thing we can do is that we spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and then the college says this study is not acceptable, or the homeowner says we don't necessarily agree with the results of it. So we try to get those issues addressed up front. Um, and uh, we haven't spent much of time on this thing, but uh, looking at the Cameron's calendar, doing a lot of work on this SMP, and as well as the town centers also keep pressuring it. There are lots of items in the town center that he needs to get moving. So what we're thinking, what I'm thinking at this point, that um, Eric is our surface water management person to be the kind of the uh, leading this thing with the, the support and assistance <laughs> of the, our wetland biologists. So we'll, we'll provide the guidance and, and consultant support to them to get this work done. But uh, give me a few more um, not few more, well, it'll be a few more before the September 1st meeting. We'll give me a little bit more time, so let me do some thinking on this thing and find out what the timing is and, and the cost and all that stuff. I don't anticipate it's going to be a budget buster. We have uh, sufficient funds and the, um, <coughs> uh, the reserve funds, uh, and we also have some savings on our capital projects that uh, this is, again, one-time expenditure. Uh, I suspect that we should be able to easily absorb the cost of this study. Nancy? Uh, in terms of, of what Cameron has recommended, I'd like to add one more thing um, that may be there in the back door. Um, that's grandfathering. <coughs> I think if people have built their docks and built their homes to a uh, baseline of 27 feet, that they should be able to replace them to that number also. They might be replacing a dock versus a house. Um, I don't think they should have to conform to just the uh, new number that we come up with <coughs> or their own study. I think they should be able to um, be consistent and say their house is okay, they're replacing a dock. They should be able to go with a grandfathered number of 27. 
Everybody agree with that? No. No? I'd, I'd say you ought to reserve that until you have the, the study in hand um, myself. But. Okay. Mark? Uh, I read the memo that you uh, submitted to the council. I had two comments on it. Uh, one is is that despite all the uh, analysis and research that's been done, uh, absolutely no evidence of an analysis by the Army Corps of Engineers nor King County has been presented to date. We simply have a document dated 1981 that says that it's at 27 feet. You also see in this memo that the uh, report done by the watershed company paid for by the city of Bellevue uh, references analysis from 1965 to 2003. 38 years of data. Now, why did they start in 1965? There's data earlier than that. Because we were in 65. Right. So, uh, at some point, the Army Corps should have looked at the lake after they changed the weir and made a new determination. And yet, to date, we've had no information that there was such an analysis by the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, the Corps letter is dated 81. That that's it's not a letter. It's simply a, a list of mm -hmm. uh, designations of 27 feet. It doesn't say how they got it. Doesn't mm -hmm. say what they looked at. Doesn't say when it was done. It doesn't. It doesn't say that King County looked at anything independently. Doesn't say how it was done. Yet we've had nothing but a string of criticisms of the 40-some uh, page uh, report, including the photographs and analysis and survey work done. Uh, on behalf of the City of Bellevue by the Watershed Company. Uh, one of the things I'd note in the criticism of that report was the uh, noted lack of analysis of properties that included both upland plants and shoreline plants that are intact mm -hmm. so that an evaluation could be made. Mm -hmm. I would note for the record that cities are prohibited from entering private property without authorization and that the City of Bellevue like the city of Sammamish is going to find that same constraint that people with properties that have not been severely changed over the years from their natural state um, may, may not be many and we may not be able to get legal access to those properties so that that's actually a limitation. My concern is, is that we're not talking about one year but two years of research analysis and uh, competing appeals of the decision in the meantime we're looking at properties, many of which have had s tremendous modification, simply coming in and saying, well, but I have a water stain on my, my uh, beach, or I have debris at a certain elevation, not with independent analysis by the city, but when the city does this report, you're saying, well, then we should have a gaggle of people walking around following each person uh, looking at the raw data simultaneously. Uh, what I would suggest here is that we have no data whatsoever other than simply the number 27 that's been written on a sheet of paper in 1981. We have an extensive report that uh, concludes that about 27.7 feet was the actual analysis. And then the 28.18 the was actually, well, if we want to extrapolate and mathematically determine that we're going to be 95 percent sure about across the whole waterfront that this is the number then we'd use this higher number of 28.18 so um, I'm fine with us doing our own study but I'd like to see us be able to do it on properties that have not been severely modified because that's been a, a complaint that we heard about the Bellevue study so I'm hoping that we can hear part of your early due diligence can be to see whether we can have availability to enough properties that have not been changed or altered to the point where you can't actually determine it. Otherwise, we'll be in the same position Bellevue was. Well, we have about 3,000 feet of that property that we own ourselves. Yes, we do. Yeah. Kathy? Um, since we're looking at the lake and the ordin ordinary high water mark of the lake, it seems like on the eastern edge, that there's a, a large stretch of property also in Issaquah that has not been developed. And can we incorporate those properties as well? Or do we have to stay within Sammamish? No, I think you could look uh, anywhere that you had access there. As long as it was a scientifically sound data point that would help us 
right. uh, determine that. I think you'd have to look at any available property that you could get legal access to. So certainly the publicly owned well, properties are great yeah, candidates. State Park. Right. And then there's some properties right north that have not been developed either. Uh, I think the owner of one of the properties lives here in the city, and I think we could get access to it. Nancy? I think we need a good scientific basis, but we're not the scientists. I think we need to rely upon the recommendations of our consultants for determining, and our staff with expertise, for determining um, what properties should be reviewed. And they have to take into consideration things like limited legal access um, or ask permission. But I can't, um, I, but we shouldn't be dictating the scientific terms of, of the studies. Um, I don't think we are. I just simply pointed no, out. No, I'm not you. I'm talking more about Mike's, Mark's yeah. comment, um, you know, in terms of which properties. I'm sorry. No, I wasn't referring to your comment, Kathy. I was re referring to which properties we go and look at. We really need to have them survey and what they think will be a valid study. And it might be they want every tenth property approximately. I mean, they might not want properties where we can get legal access if they're all in one location, for example. So, anyway. Um, okay, well. I don't want to beat it to death. Okay, we've beaten it to death already. We have. Uh, all right. I think, I think we basically are going with your recommendation. <coughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, would yeah. you look at grandfathering, though, please? I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Council. You've gone through this thing. This has okay. been a long process. Uh, now it's the work. Next on, the, next on the agenda. Okay. No new business. Council reports. Let's see if you start with your end. Uh, why don't you start down there if you wouldn't mind? I'm okay, we will start with your end. Okay, I'll start on this end. Two things uh, briefly. Uh, one, uh, I uh, had the pleasure with my wife and some friends of enjoying the, uh, the Shakespeare presentation in the park uh, on Thursday that was put on by the uh, uh, Seattle Shakespeare, which uh, combined with the Wooden O, which used to do it. And uh, it was a, another wonderful presentation. Uh, my unscientific observation is more people attended last that Thursday than I've ever seen before, and I think I've gone to most of them. Uh, and. I've also had the pleasure of, uh, of going to both of the Saturday, uh, uh, not Saturday, the music concerts on uh, Thursday, excuse me. Uh, Shakespeare yeah, was on I Saturday. Was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I was mixed up. Shakespeare's on Saturday and the music concerts on Thursday. And of course, there again, I think the attendance is up. What, what I find fascinating is it's such a beautiful setting. It's such a great, uh, enjoyable entertainment. Uh, it would almost be like we must be keeping this as a hidden secret, but we're not. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful event. So uh, anybody who, who hears this, I, I hope if they haven't already tried it, they give it a try. Mr. City Manager. Uh, I was biking this Saturday, and it was in the, uh, it was in the uh, downtown Seattle area in front of the c city of Seattle. There's a big park and waterfront. Uh, I have a comment regarding that we have a hidden secret here. I'm not quite sure it is that much secret. <laughs> I wanted to take a break, sat on the bench, and uh, there was two bikers came along. They said, so we're talking. And I, they asked me where I was, and I said, I'm from Sammamish area. And he says, says, we love going to your Pine Lake Park. <laughs> 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 Apparently, they've been a regular visitors of our Pine Lake Park. And they love it. They love the improvements that they, the, the city did. And it was, it was, they couldn't talk highly enough about that. So I think it's being discovered out there. So better be careful. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I guess you want to have it hidden from outside the city limits, but it's okay to have it inside. Uh, the second thing I wanted to, to mention, uh, I've, um, because of my work on the uh, on National League of Cities in, in the finance area, I've kind of kept my, my uh, attention on uh, uh, issues going on in other places in the country for, for two reasons. One, tying directly with that work, but, but really more importantly is I think there's, you can learn from others' mistakes and you can also identify trends that are troublesome before they become a problem for us. And uh, there, there's a couple things that just randomly uh, came together quite interestingly. Uh, the, the sixth largest city in the United States uh, Philadelphia has now uh, stopped paying vendors and suppliers because of a cash crisis. Uh, and part of that cash crisis is because of pension obligations that they put in legislatively that they can't pay for. 
and it's we, we've seen this in many other areas but uh, uh, you know for Philadelphia to go to this extreme step uh, you know it shows the seriousness of it uh, there was also a very interesting um, uh, article uh, in the uh, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago on uh, the problems with uh, with public pensions being unfunded and what's happening and, and the irony is is a, is a lot of the unions are really getting up in arms about this and you'd think maybe that they wouldn't be so concerned is what they call pension spiking and and what that is are games that are played and and sadly often with a collusion of elected bodies and what they do is they will work a deal with somebody that maybe they want to leave or retire early or something like this and they'll give them a huge increase in salary that that goes on for a couple of uh, weeks before they leave and of course what that does is it uh, greatly increases their their pension payout especially if the pension formula is based on the last year uh, other pension spiking techniques are to uh, allow lots of rollover of, of vacation and 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 the problem with this is it creates a liability that the pension system has to pay for which there is no input of money from anybody not the individual's contribution not the city's contribution and uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 next thing that uh, kind of ties with that uh, that also came up uh, it's it's I think it's very important to try to track uh, public spending with private spending uh, and particularly on, uh, on on salary levels because you know the idea of a salary system is it should be fair and fair means that it's comparable for given uh, skill and work with uh, with other jobs that are similar there's a uh, an organization uh, that uh, uh, studies this uh, and it's uh, there there's a, a couple of them the the Watson uh, uh, Wyatt worldwide and the Hay group I am from my past work I'm familiar with the Hay group because they did a lot of work for the company I was involved in but what they do is they go out and study what's going on so people can say what what perspective is there and what they found is that pay increases in the private sector uh, for 2009 which is based on 2000 you know 2009 is a raise over 2008 uh, average between two and three percent and uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Labor Department was saying that pay for the average worker increased 2.2 percent in the year ended March 31st, 2009, uh, uh, which was uh, 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 in that in that same ballpark. And of course, what we're finding is that in some cases, uh, public sector pay is going up many times that. And I mean, it's wonderful if you can pay for it, but the problem is the the difficulty of paying for it. And then, very interestingly, the, uh, the spokesman uh, review from Spokane had a front page story of a week and a half ago talking about uh, the headline was disproportionate pay growth for public workers has city leaders asking unions for concessions. What it is is that it's not all public workers. It's certain segments where there the, have been enormous increases over a number of years. And again, what it does is it, it, it creates an inequity uh, with the taxpayer who typically is a private sector worker not seeing this or it's a, a small business owner who is uh, seeing lots of problems saying why should I have my taxes go up to pay for benefits that are uh, disproportional so it's 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 a as we identified at National League of Cities it, it's probably the, the next uh, big crisis to, to affect uh, state and local government and we're already seeing it a la Philadelphia uh, and I think by seeing the the trend of where this is going hopefully uh, public uh, officials everywhere who really have the responsibility for making sound decisions on this will start to uh, uh, recognize that some change is needed before we really get into a pretty serious financial situation uh, we've seen a number of uh, cities of course that have been laying people off uh, and you know I think as an observation the, the political process has a tough time making difficult decisions unless there's a crisis. And yet, the time to make the difficult decisions is before the crisis. And so it becomes a proactive rather than a reactive mode. So I thought it was really quite fascinating that all of this, I mean, this is just uh, high level uh, publicity that, uh, that our uh, various newspapers are, are focusing, uh, all kind of just came together in the last, uh, in the last week. That completes my report. Thank you for that uplifting report. Yeah. <laughs>
That's we quite, quite an issue you've been following. <laughs> Michelle? Um, I actually have uh, three little things to talk about. One, um, first of all, what's on my mind is um, our cultural heritage. Um, I see the Art Commission meeting tonight and um, talking about projects and bringing artwork and um, and uh, the, our support for them and I'm disappointed that the Heritage Society isn't meeting in that room over there talking about our cultural heritage and preservation of our history for the city of Sammamish and um, I see that we have no resolution on what's happening with the Freed House or what we're going to do with it or what our goals are for cultural heritage and historic preservation in Sammamish and so uh, that's very disappointing to me that uh, we're here with no resolution um, I'd really like to for the council to think about uh, bringing that project back and, and looking at it again. I think it's totally unfair to ask them to go out and raise money for a project that doesn't have um, doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a, a sponsor, doesn't have a, a place to park it. I, I think it's totally unrealistic to be asking the Heritage Society to go out in the community and raise money for something that's that doesn't have um, doesn't have a sponsor so um, I'd like to uh, over our vacation break maybe we can give some thought to that because uh, there's lots of documentation Virginia is going to be leaving the the state her house is full of historical uh, information and and precious items that uh, should be important to us and there's no place to put those things and we have the Baker house over on 24th that's also full of of items that need to have a home and need to be displayed and need to have something going on and I just feel like the city has fallen flat on the face of, of, of trying to work work something out on that and so it troubles me that uh, that we've left it in that uh, position uh, and we're going on break um, and on a lighter note um, I just got back from a four-day state competition with 200 horsewomen from all over the state of Washington. And there were two teams from Sammamish there, representing Sammamish in all of the introductions. One of them was our team, High Valley Riders, and we say we're from Sammamish mainly because Rock Meadow Equestrian Center sponsors us all winter long to practice over there. So we that's why we call Sammamish our home, even though uh, only um, Four out of the 20 members are actually living in Sammamish. Um, and another team, Cowgirl Spirit, that um, actually rescues horses and rehabilitates them, also competes in that um, on the non-competitive side. They just kind of do it to, to um, showcase what they're doing. Um, so, you know, that was interesting to get promoted. That was down in Spanaway and uh, had quite an audience. And. Uh, and then the third item is we've had a bear in our backyard this whole week every night and um, mm -hmm. my my daughter is terrified um, she he's eating cherries and he's eating huckleberries and he's waving at us <laughs> and um, you know she's afraid when my kids are afraid to um, you know they come home at night from work and they're like terrified to you know even get in the front door so um, you know Fish and Wildlife has said you know there's nothing they can do but what can we do? I mean, I, I want this bear moved somewhere that's more appropriate for him to uh, be making a living than in my backyard. Like Jack, right? Jack's house is the closest Somewhere. to your house, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. I don't know. When we call yeah, Fish and Wildlife, they said, time. well, is he a menace? Well, Bit he's... Just put it up. I mean, he's not threatening anybody, but, you know, it's... It's yeah. pretty frightening, you know. I'll take a look at it. You're close to a wildlife corridor. That's the problem. What do you mean? <laughs> wildlife corridor? No. And, and we've had a bobcat in our yard, too. And I, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I live in Sammamish, a population of 41,000 people. And I have all these critters in my backyard. He Don wants to banish all critters. He doesn't believe critters belong in the urban area at all. M Michelle, have you tried putting up a sign, no bears to feed here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Mark? So anyhow, I hope you give some thought to, I the mean, city we, need, we need to talk about it. Okay. Uh, I uh, just returned from our uh, family vacation, and uh, 
in Montana they have a lot of bears. They they do have bear spray that they sell. It's expensive, but you might really? consider getting. They say it works. Pepper spray a, with a it spray. It looks like a big can of mace, and it will it's deter a bear in a bear attack, especially if it's not a grizzly bear. So the way that works is that you got to capture the bear and uh, make it open his mouth and spray some That's of that right, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, they open wide. <laughs> two things I wanted to, well, three things I wanted to mention. One is uh, we uh, were looking at colleges for our kids. Uh, at uh, Central, they have um, a stream that runs through um, Ellensburg, and um, it runs through the campus. Uh, and we were told today that it's uh, too polluted to touch. Oh, and has no fish in it. <laughs> Although it's you know it's not 12 Yakima. feet wide and two and a half feet deep and running quickly and is relatively cold. It's full of agricultural pollution and yeah. is not to be touched. And they're warned away, which seems too bad. In other parts of Ellensburg, they were actually doing some extensive uh, wetland rehab along streams, which was mm -hmm. quite encouraging. In um, when we were in um, um, visiting WSU in Pullman, uh, two things I wanted to mention. One is that the hotel we were in was two stories, and there was no elevator. And they said, "Well, th there's no elevator because there's no basement. We're actually built over a stream." And when you did run to the end of the building, you could literally see that there was a parallel concrete foundations about 30 feet apart, and they were literally had built the quality in there over a, a pretty substantial stream. Um, my my point about that is that we we want to be real careful in talking about um, vesting stuff to you know, into the, the, the very distant future, or as I call it, infinity. Um, because that means really that in this case there would never be a chance to undo this section of stream and, you know, although the property is big enough where they could do other things, um, they may be vested uh, to do that. So when we look at vesting, let's be careful. And finally, on a cheery note, the third thing is we were walking around downtown Pullman and in the street, they had actually had uh, the names of people who were distinguished and who had made a significant contribution to the city of Pullman. And uh, one of the names on that list was our very own Pete Butkus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just mentioned that uh, not only has Pete made a significant uh, impact to the quality of life here in the city of Sammamish, but uh, he is remembered uh, in a very concrete way <laughs> in, in the uh, city of Pullman from which he came. Thank you. And his wife, Carolyn, should be there also because she was mayor of Pullman. Well, I only saw Pete's name. Uh -oh. I, maybe there's another one with Carolyn's name on it that was down the street. They had many different it's people different who were identified. Name. Yeah, different last name. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you would have recognized it because she has a different last name. Mm -hmm. Jack? No uh, report. Kathy? Yes, three items. And um, Michelle, I'm glad you brought up the Freed House because uh, like you, I am very disappointed that we haven't been able to do anything for the uh, Heritage Society. I was particularly disappointed uh, with the report that we got back from Jesse that the Kelman property is in such a state that we can't even allow the uh, Heritage Society to store their materials there. This is a property that we spent several million dollars for and it is in such bad shape with urine smells that we can't even allow the Heritage Society to store their things in there for fear of being damaged. Um, I am really concerned that nobody responded on the council. Nobody seems to be concerned that this property that we spent millions of dollars for is deteriorating in this way and that we aren't going to set some sort of a policy to uh, take care of that property. So at least the Heritage Society would have a place to store things and to meet and to be able to catalog their property or their materials. So um, you, know, you talk about the Freed House, but we have a building there that they could use if it were in better shape. Don tells me he goes over there frequently and finds doors open and windows open. Well, let's not, let's not exaggerate it. I saw one window from here open. And you said a door, and, and you said door. the door to the, mm -hmm. the uh, outside building. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's three, three occasions. But on a lighter note, um, uh, the kickoff of Sound Transit, the Link Light Rail Transportation Choices Coalition was out handing out materials and was uh, assisting with the opening of Link Light Rail on Saturday. And we spent four hours 
at the King Street Station uh, where we got to observe all the Sounder fans coming and streaming by. But I was absolutely, literally amazed because one of the things we intended to do was to ask people to sign up and to become members of Transportation Choices. And I thought, nobody will take the time to do this. You know, they're busy getting in line. They're busy going to other things. In the four-hour shift that I was on, we had over 40 people stop and fill out a form and actually talk to us and want to be members to participate in getting something done about further transit, pedestrians, bike paths, et cetera. So that was really exciting. And the event on Friday night <coughs> could not have been more fun. There were over 500 people in attendance at the Texas and Trains event. Uh, Hales Ales has created a brand new ale, light rail ale, which will go on the market, but it was, it was previewed that night. Um, uh, Joan Soda came up with 500 bottles of soda with Texas and Trains labels on them. And I would say fully a third of the men were in Texas. And we were, when Warren picked me up, we went over to the parking what, lot. What are that? How was that? I yeah, I mean, it was just, it was incredible. <laughs> people were so dressed up. You never see people dressed in Seattle. Women were in formal dresses and cocktail dresses and men in, in uh, Texas and when we weren't picked me up and we went over to park and we were waiting for it to shift over to the past five o'clock so we'd only pay six dollars so there was he and Dan and there were three women and all dressed up and people would walk by and say where are you going where are you going you know it's just like they were just stunned to see so many people so so dressed up. telling you were just dressing up to ride that, light rail? that's it we were just, <laughs> yeah. just for there for light rail so that was a really fun event had a chance to talk to patty murray for a little bit about getting some more transit money and talked a little bit about health care as well because that's uh, a special interest of mine uh, but lastly uh, we had the uh, regional transit committee meeting on wednesday we really didn't get a lot accomplished on Wednesday because there isn't a lot to do on the comprehensive plan or the financial plan until we get information. And to, yesterday I received an email from Karen that uh, the executive is going to be releasing the budget in August. And even though we do not have an RTC meeting scheduled, we're going to establish a separate one for the, the, the caucus to look at the budget and get a first look at the budget and what the proposal is and to get some idea of what kind of cuts may be in order. Nancy? A couple of things. Um, <coughs> talking to one of my neighbors uh, immediately adjacent to my property who is not actually on the lake, uh, although he has rights to shared waterfront, he told me that he was told that the city was taking the lakefront owners' properties because of the buffers. And I thought, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> um, so there are rumor mills out there that we're behaving uh, in a very <clears throat> uh, taking property. Um, I think when you put it into perspective, um, I favor uh, on Pine and Beaver Lakes a 45-foot buffer vegetation strip. Um, that could be reduced down maybe to 25 or 30. I think that's the <coughs> minimum that will be effective. But I'm only one of seven, so that's not my choice. But I think when you look at how we have tried to implement the buffers, first of all, on a width across the property, 25% has no restrictions in the active use area. Another 25% could be ornamental plantings. Um, non-native sometimes if it's if they're not um, found to be detrimental by staff so you're left with 50 percent nancy th this is council uh, reports time this is a report time well you know what do you do when you're accused by the city by your neighbors of taking property okay well you try you, and explain it okay that's the report then <laughs> Okay, but let's not reopen the, okay. the Shoreline Master Program right now. Well, but the report is that, you know, the minimal impact of what we are doing is 50% of the width of the lot times 15, which can be reduced down by 5. So you're, in most cases, you're talking a few hundred feet. Even if you have a, a lot that's 135 feet, you're talking 1,012 a, a square feet. It's minimal. I mean... So I'm not sure where they, they're getting the idea that they're losing their property. Second point I have is about the Freed House. Um, again, uh, you know, I would support 
the city moving it onto the city property and so forth, uh, but I want to see some community commitment to raise about $200,000. I don't think it's fair to let the city pick up the bag on that, and there's no assurances that um, any funds would be forthcoming from the community. So, however, I would like to see it, it uh, con consideration giving to doing anything we can to preserve it over this next winter, um, rather than just letting it fall apart unless we make a conscious decision to do that. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I just have a couple of items. One, I went to the RIA 8 meeting last week, Water Resource Inventory Area Number 8, and uh, one of the items that was brought up was the King Conservation District uh, a s Special Assessment Proposal. And uh, in case you didn't know it, every lot in, in the city pays $10 a year to the King Conservation District. And over the last three years, that $10 was split, $5 going to the, to the RIAs, $3 going to King Conservation District for administration and, and their grant programs, and $2 uh, going to the cities. Now, it doesn't come to the city directly. You have to apply for it, but it's, it's set aside for you. So we know if we have 14,000 lots, we know we've got $28,000 sitting in a, in a reserve uh, fund, and if we have an appropriate project, then we can uh, draw on that. And we did for the Zacoose Creek uh, daylighting. So that was a formula which worked very well because cities could count on that. They knew how much money and they could build it up over a couple of years. And um, the King Conservation District is proposing to change that and basically take all the money themselves and, uh, and oh, we got something here we're handing out. Good. I got mine, thanks. Oh. Um, and so the, the Raya 8 people decided to write a letter to King Conservation District uh, suggesting that don't change the formula, go back to the old formula. And I suggested they wanted to change it and have a five-year term to it, and I suggested going back to three years. And I drafted up a letter, and thank you, Ben, for making copies of it. I have a letter here which basically says that uh, like uh, City of Sammamish opposes the reduction in funding to the RIAs and member jurisdictions and the lack of clarity between the, the uh, various grant programs as proposed by the KCD um, and support status quo. And if, if I have some head noddings on this, we could send this letter to the King Conservation District. And, and they're take, planning to take that over to just roll it into what they can offer for grants, Put, move it over to the other grant. That yeah, they, they wanted to take all the ten dollars into their oh. coffer and then, and then, then have a formula, <laughs> yeah, and distribute it. And they assure that the, the rias and the cities will get their fair share, but you can't count on it. Right. And so uh, this letter proposes to maintain the existing structure, so you can count on where the money's being spent. Right. Are cities going after and getting their money for little projects, or is yes. it just sitting there? Yeah. We yeah. have, we have in the past got some projects, and we mm -hmm. will intend to do more. Well, do they have some other projects that they have some need for larger pots of money uh, that would benefit no, multiple cities? They mostly than work directly with uh, property owners out in rural King County. Mm -hmm. That's my perception. So we, is that where the money might go then if, if it doesn't come back to the member cities? That's possible, yeah. It's just, uh, it's just very uh, obtuse. The, the proposal they have, it's, it's unclear how much money would be available, or would you be in a pot competing with other cities rather than knowing that there's so much money come that you deserve and coming to your city if you want to use it? Mm -hmm. Nancy? It seems to me this came up a few years ago, too, the allocation formula. Three years ago, because it used to be $5 a parcel, and it went up to $10. And, and this is a, a vote of the King County Council determines this. so. They will be going to the King County Council with their proposal, and and so uh, it's important for us if we object to that to put our our letter in. My comment was going to be though before I got in, uh, was going to be something to the effect of something like I think three years ago there was a grab by county to put it into their funding, mm -hmm. so they could ha dish out some of it. Um, and that was one reason why the allocation was important. I could easily see that coming back to haunt us 
uh, given the financial, uh, the scarcity of financial resources available to them. So I like the clear black and white of the th two, three, and five because it also avoids that possibility. Yeah. Okay. I do have to wear a shirt, though. Be nice. Well, yeah, I wore this shirt just to remind myself to bring this topic up and also to uh, think in terms of the kokanee, which we are so concerned about. Mm. Uh, the other issue I had is not an issue, just a report to, to follow up on Kathy's report. I did attend the inaugural light rail ride. Uh, actually, I wasn't on the inaugural ride. Uh, there were two trains. One came from Tukwila with the mayor of Tukwila on it. One came from Seattle with the mayor of Seattle on it, and they met in the middle. And the rest of us sat in the middle for about an hour or so waiting for those two trains to come. <laughs> So that they we could cut the ribbon. You were. We were kind of gossiping in the morning trying to figure out what happened to you. <laughs> so then I hopped on the train, went down the Tuckwill, and then came all the way back up, up to Seattle. And uh, I still hold by my original feeling, and that is it's very disappointing that it's not totally grade separated. Uh, it, it just dawdles down the Rainier Valley in, in grade, and watching the cars go by faster than the train was a little disappointing. Um, uh, you know, we rode it to Mount Baker, so we didn't have that same experience. Uh huh. Yeah. Although the amount of security around was just incredible. Yeah. Just but it was exciting. So that's my report, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two quick reports. And, um, and would you comment on the calendar because the calendar has has been revised and it doesn't follow our normal scheme of the it first, we, second. And Monday, Tuesday, and Tuesday right? weeks. Uh -huh. I, I know that there's some weird months. Yeah, there September. Are some weird dates. Okay. Um, Kathy, I don't. Which? I don't. Well, let, let Ben make his comments, but we were noticing that it doesn't follow the normal scheme, and some of us plan vacation time around that. It's and usually no, first, Monday, second, Tuesday. and third Tuesdays, and the third Mondays. Right. right. So in September, it's the first Tuesday, second Tuesday, third Tuesday, and fourth Tuesday. There's no, no fourth Monday. Monday. Tuesday. There's or there five are actually meetings. five Tuesdays. Yeah, five, fourth five. Monday and the fifth Tuesday. I'll follow up on that one. Let me and see. December is the same. December is uh, the first Tuesday, second Tuesday, third Monday. And fourth Tuesday. I think it was Deputy Mayor and Mayor that they think that we should work <laughs> harder. That it was a long <laughs> evening. Actually, <laughs> Kathy, in September, the third Monday is the 21st, I believe. No. I'll follow up. I'll check on that one. Yeah, get back to you on that one, Kathy. Maybe it is. I'll follow up the calendar and get and back to you. Have a 22nd. Mm -hmm. Right. We have an extra meeting. Mm -hmm. Is that okay if I get back yeah. to you in the yeah. August recess before the September meeting? Okay. Uh, two items. Uh, we are applying for a grant money. Uh, it's called the commute trip reduction. Uh, the grant is going to be applied with the number of cities together in the amount of $500,000. It's oh. a program is similar to the city of Redmond's. Um, this particular grant uh, is uh, requ the requirements for the grant is a $250,000 matching. Uh, the city of Sammamish share is $21,487 over three years, all of which can be covered under the existing city program, so we don't have to come up with the hard cash. The existing programs like what we do in our outreach and website and newsletters and et cetera. So we will use those as our in-kind contribution to come up with the city of Sammamish's matching funds that does not require any additional cash coming out. Having said that, okay. that's for three year. After the three year, the program stops. The federal funding stops. So at that point, that the city has no obligation to continue with this program. But at that time, the city may take a look at it, see what, um, what partnership that we may uh, form with the others to be able to do this. Is the commute trip reduction for the city employees? City employees, as well as the people are living in the city, commuting to other parts of the okay, Puget Sound because region. Because most I'm familiar with are, are the employer-employee relationship. Yeah, this will be a little bit wider. That's why we wanted to do it with the consortium of cities in Bellevue, Redmond, Sammamish, Mercer Island, Kirkland. We're hoping maybe the Seattle might be also well, joining us. Well, let's figure out how to make sure that we can retain some bus service then. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, so it's it's a news. It's the I think it will be a helpful program, especially as we get our town center program moving forward. I just wanted to let the council know. The second one is that the Lower Sammamish Common project started. That's a good news. Contractors is there doing the excavation and doing some dirt work. The bad news is that we're we're discovering some soft spots as we're doing some excavation. So um, obviously we want to do this job one time and we want to do it right. So uh, this, we're some, some places we're excavating additional three feet to take the unsuitable soil. Fortunate part of it is that the part of the job we were going to do the excavation to provide the rain gardens, the soil is coming from that area as a good soil. Oh, good. So we're taking that soil, putting it out there in the very way it encounter bad soil. So the, we're trying to balance it out. There will be s some additional cost, however, hauling that bad soil from site somewhere else. You had already given me some authority with the contract award to deal with those contingencies. We're still trying to get the scope of it at this point. But it's, it's full steam ahead. It's moving, so our intent is to complete the project uh, hopefully at the end of September. That's the city manager's report. Okay, there's an executive session and uh, dealing with personnel issues pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101G. And also the property acquisition. And also a possible acquisition of property. Okay. And the expected uh, time is going to be, what, an hour? Hour or so? Hour. An hour. And will there be action after the session? Yes, I think so. Okay, so anybody that wants to see the rest of the meeting has to sit around for an hour. <laughs> okay, adjourn to executive session. Can we take a break? Sure. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Count to ten. Oh. Okay, we're back in session after executive session. The personnel matter was uh, evaluation of the city manager, and Lee Felling took the lead on that. And Lee, could you give us a report? Okay, we uh, uh, completed uh, our annual evaluation of the performance of the city manager. Uh, this is in accordance with. Uh, 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 timing uh, set out in an original employment agreement uh, back in 2004. Uh, we completed an annual review and uh, based this on specific goals and criteria that we developed jointly uh, with the City Council at the annual retreat and then also during other dialogue periods. Uh, we completed that uh, uh, evaluation and uh, the Council during executive session uh, reviewed that. Uh, we put this in the form of a document which will be entered into the record and is available for uh, uh, view uh, as anyone may wish. Uh, and what we wanted to do as a summary is, of course, recognize our, our city manager uh, for the excellent performance that he has accomplished uh, over this last year and are very much looking forward to continuing our productive relationship uh, moving forward into the challenges of the year ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Felling. And uh, we all spoke very highly of the performance of our city manager and, and pleased to announce that he's not leaving us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's now, been a privilege to serve you. Is there any other business before the council this evening? None. Hearing none, council is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to move that we send Stan's wife a bouquet of flowers. For <laughs>